We are live. We are live. Well, good evening, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. Today's event is another in a series of webinars we've organized under the banner of the Centre for Intelligent Design in the UK. My name is David Galloway, and I've been joined by some colleagues today to discuss the fascinating topic of the mystery of life's origin. Both our speakers are well known in their own right, and both have recently been listed amongst the co-authors of a revised and updated version of a significant book, the first edition of which appeared in 1984, Mystery of Life's Origin. The argument addressed in that original publication centred on whether there was an adequate physical basis to explain how complex life was generated from simpler chemistry. So here we are, 35 years on, and it will be fascinating to consider how much progress has been made, how much further on are we now in our understanding of the mystery of life's origin. There certainly appears to be plenty of interest and plenty of research activity of various kinds, and despite the interest, there remains a deep-seated sense of implausibility that somehow chemical systems self-organised into functional macromolecules or even further into self-generating, self-sustaining, metabolising cells with a capacity to reproduce. Indeed, within the past week, there's been a report in the popular press here in the UK that purports to show that chemically the origins of metabolic activity have emerged as a result of an entirely natural unguided process. And I read these chemical steps again and my memories of my undergraduate days came flooding back. I can remember struggling to master the steps of the Krebs cycle, one of the basic concepts in carbohydrate metabolism. And there, there they were, they were all there, my old friends, citric and isocitric acid, alpha ketoglutarate, succinate, fumarate and so on. And ultimately to the wonders of ATP production and the electron transport chain, it brought me back to my second year in medical school. But clearly it still remains a stretch to get from metabolic pathways to a living, functioning, reproducing cell or organism. And it's clear that the great hope of origin of life research is to explain how that process might have first got underway. So today I'm really delighted to welcome our two speakers. We have Steve Meyer. Steve I've known for probably more than 10 years now and it's a real pleasure to welcome him to speak to this topic. Steve has a long-standing interest in this area and has become internationally well known in the biological design world, having written several important books, including the best-selling Signature in the Cell and more recently Darwin's Doubt. And Steve is joining us from Seattle in Washington State. And it's also a great pleasure virtually to meet Jim Tour today. Jim is from Houston in Texas. I've heard many of his lectures online on a variety of topics and his chemical repertoire as an innovative synthetic organic chemist is almost unparalleled. And when you get the chance, I really recommend that you take a look at his website, jmtour.com. You'll get a real sense of the kind of work in which he's involved. So I reckon today we're in for an intellectual treat as Jim begins our session by exposing some of the chemical hurdles that the origin of life research community need to address and overcome before they can provide a persuasive case for abiogenesis, life from non-life. So our running order today is that Jim will speak first and then we'll have a very short break, maybe one or two questions, and then Steve will follow and uh, David Williams, one of my colleagues, will moderate the Q&A. And so you can submit your questions and comments on the YouTube chat facility as we go and we'll take it from there. So first of all, let me introduce Jim Tour and hand over Jim to you for your talk to us this evening. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I would be glad to start here. I'm going to put up my slides. Okay, so I've been asked to speak a critique of chemical evolution in origin of life and exchanges with researchers therein. I crossed out chemical evolution in because chemicals don't evolve. Uh, these, this is another example of terms taken from biology and moved into the realm of synthetic chemistry and, and, uh, or, or uh, uh, abiogenesis. It's, a, it's really ridiculous to put, put that term in there. 
And as far as uh, what was just being said about, um, about chemical metabolism, I'd have to look at that paper. I just briefly glanced at it just minutes ago. And uh, there is, I'm sure there's no extrapolation. There, there may have been a word extrapolation, but actual uh, showing of ATP, I would be very surprised. Uh, that, that's a complicated chemistry. Okay, so origin of life. Molecules don't care about life. They just don't. Organisms care about life. Chemistry, on the contrary, is utterly indifferent to life. Without a biologically derived entity acting upon them, molecules have never been shown to evolve toward life. Never. They don't evolve toward life. They don't go toward life. They don't know to go toward life. They have no brain. And uh, uh, yes, people can make molecules do certain things, but those are biological entities acting upon them. But molecules don't do that by themselves. They don't even, they don't even uh, 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 move toward any sort of complex assembly at all. Uh, they might move toward AAA or ABAB, <clears throat> but certainly not the complex patterns that, that, that we see in biological systems. So this is a car, it's got a lot of different parts. Uh, it's not all the parts because <clears throat> certainly there's still some parts that are put together here. <clears throat> but if you were given these parts, could you reconstruct that car? Maybe some people could, but most people could not. I mean, if you were never given any directions, could you? It'd be hard for anybody to do it. Uh, but but uh, even if you were given directions, it'd be hard. And uh, do you have the tools to do that? I mean, you need certain tools to clamp down on a piston ring and put it over a piston. I mean, you need tools to do that. Uh, where do the tools come from? All of those need to be acquired. Chemistry is the same way. You get you, There's a lot of parts in a cell, a lot more than this. And uh, so... And all those chemicals are not hap happily in the same room like you see here. They would be spread out throughout the entire planet. Some at the bottom of the ocean, some at the top of, of a mountain, and all over. And imagine trying to go and find all these so that you could get them together. Now, is the earth covered, covered in all sorts of parts like this? No. And, uh, um, and so, so it's, it's hard. And some people say, well, it came from outer space. Okay, you want to find it there? You want to try to get it from there to earth all in one place to build a cell. And the other thing is parts go bad. Uh, they go bad with time. And it's the same with chemicals. Time tears them up. And uh, people who don't know that uh, are people who haven't worked with, with chemicals before. So um, what is the origin of, of life? Um, well, you know, I'd like to point to a cell. Some people say, well, you know, a, 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 uh, Eukaryotic cell is too complex. Why not go to a prokaryote? So we'll, we'll look at bacteria. Bacteria are still super complex. I mean, even if you don't have the flagella, you still have lots and lots of, of parts in here. You have the nucleoid. Uh, you, have, you, have, you have to have DNA. You have to have ribosomes. You have to have, uh, uh, and in fact, their, their, their membrane, their cell wall is, is, is more complex than, than you would have, say, in a eukaryotic cell. And all of these are difficult to think about how they came together. You, you have a, a glycoprotein and, and, and a, a, a bilayer. And many people will argue, and, and, and this, is, this is what I've seen in my one discussion uh, online with an origin of life researcher, is they're trying to redefine life and trying to say, well, it's simpler life. It's simpler life than what we know of. But from what I understand, and I'm, I'm doing some more reading on that right now, is that if we look back at some of the simplest cells, some of the simplest cells uh, uh, that, that we can find in, in, the, in the, the record of, of, if we just look at the record of the earth, that, that uh, uh, they're as complex as our simplest cells today. And how many parts can you start yanking out of a car before it doesn't run? How many parts can you start yanking out of a cell before it runs? I was talking with one researcher and he says, well, you don't even, I said, where, where, did, the, where did this cell come from? He says, you, you don't need all, all, all of this stuff. I said, how many genomes do you think you need? He said, I'm not sure you need any. I said, oh, really, what do you need? He says, all you need is RNA. Oh, really, all you need is RNA. And how does that work, work as, a, as, as, as a system that has anything related to life? And his reply was, I don't know, but 
Maybe all you need is RNA. So, you know, when you tell stories about this, then you can make it as simple as you want. But anything with life as we know it is highly complex. And if you just want to toss at the feet of evolution to go from simple life to more complex life like we know it today, how simple would you like to get? What features does it has to ha have, has to ha have to have in order to be life? All right, so almost every chemical synthesis experiment in origin of life research can be, can be summed up by this. Um, uh, by this protocol. So, so don't send me paper after paper and say, well, what about this? They, I guarantee you it's, it, it, it's, it's in this. Per, you, they purchase some chemicals generally in high purity from a chemical company. And they mix those chemicals together in water at high concentrations, concentrations that never could have been found on an early earth unless the early earth was, fit, was only made up of those compounds or in a specific order under some set of carefully devised conditions in a modern laboratory. They'll obtain a, moder a, a mixture of compounds that have a resemblance to one or more of the basic four classes of chemicals needed for life. You got to have carbohydrates, nucleic acids, amino acids, and lipids. We don't know how to have life without all four of those. Then they'll publish a paper making bold assertions about origin of life from these functionless crude mixtures of stereochemically scrambled intermediates, much like Miller did in 1952. They engage with the ever gullible press to dial up the knob of unjustified extrapolations. They watch the mesmerized layperson exclaim, you see, scientists understand how life formed. Then they encourage a generation of science textbook writers to make colorful, deceptive cartoons of raw chemicals assembling into cells which then emerge as slithering creatures from a prehistoric pond. And there are surveys, surveys that are being taken. I, I, I've uh, gotten some early drafts of surveys that are about to come out where they are, are uh, uh, asking students, young students, uh, college level students about these origin of life experiments. And these very same things that are written here, these, these cells going together to, to make slithering creatures. This is what they're taught and this is what they come out believing. This is what they believe. So when you say nobody believes this, oh yeah, there's a lot of people that believe this. So I was on, on that, uh, that program with Unbelievable and, and uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the announcer there, he certainly said, you know, is this right? He was asking uh, one origin of life researcher and it's, on, it's, it's recorded. And the origin of life set researcher said, yeah, that's approximately it. All right, the synthesis problem is molecules that compose living systems almost always show homochirality. So you have one chirality, that's one handedness and not the other. Nobody knows how that was done on an early earth. Uh, there's been proposals when you end up looking at the data, the data is just terrible to figure out how you got homochirality. When building with molecular systems, constant redesigns are needed, which take the synthesis back to step one. It's often impossible to remove a moiety once it's been added to a molecule. The synthetic reactions do not know how to stop their current course of progression or why to stop. There's no targeted goal. Time, although claimed to be the great savior of abiogenesis, can actually be the enemy. For example, carbohydrates are kinetic products that undergo caramelization, the Kanazara reaction. A prebiotic system does not have the ability to easily purify structures. Reagent addition order is essential. You have to know which reagent to put in first. How does nature do that on a regular basis over and over again? Nobody knows. The parameters of temperature, pressure, solvent, light or no light, pH, atmosphere, gases or no gases have to be carefully controlled in order to build complex molecular structures. You know who knows this the best? Is synthetic chemists. Synthet synthetic chemists know what I'm talking about. Those who build molecules for a living. Not all chemists, but those who build molecules for a living, they know how hard it is. And this doesn't happen by itself. Then you have to have characterization at each step. That's utterly essential, but it's hard in a prebiotic system to consider because it knows nothing of molecular structure. It doesn't know what it's going toward. There's no target. The mass transfer problem, it's the killer of all roots. I mean, anybody who's made any complex synthesis trying to make a molecule, you run out of starting materials, so you have to go back and make more, but no laboratory notebook was ever kept. So how do you go back and make more? And, and this cry that, oh, nature keeps making it. Keeps making what? With all the possibilities of carbohydrate structure, it keep, keep making what? It made the, the, the same structure that it had made yesterday? No, that can't happen. It made the same RNA sequence that it made yesterday? No, it can't happen. 
time is a problem. Here's an example. While Eschen Moser, who did a lot on carbohydrate synthesis, he teaches that the total amount of four diastereomers was largely unchanged, but that's not entirely correct. His own data show that the combined yield of the four diastereomers dropped from 34% to 30% over the course of an additional 22 weeks. Hence, a relative 12% loss of pentoses uh, uh, over the, the 22 week period. So he was trying to make uh, these pentoses, which, which are the, the chain linker for, for both RNA and DNA. And as it sat for 22 weeks, he lost 12%, and that's in a clean laboratory. Now, what happens? That is, a, that is a, a just, just a twinkling of an eye when you're talking about geological timescales. Organic molecules decompose. They decompose, they fall apart. The other thing is here, you know, people have challenged me, oh, did the Kenazara reaction is no problem. Oh, really? Here's from 1974, a paper that says the foremost reaction. Now that's the reaction that's, that's used, proposed to be used to make carbohydrates. The foremost reaction, the homogeneously catalyzed condensation of formaldehyde to sugars, proceeds simultaneously with Kanazaro and cross Kanazaro reactions. So Kanazaro does cause decomposition of these things. So if you had it, it's gonna fall apart because of the Kanazaro reaction. You got, you got formaldehyde around, this, that's gonna happen. These are real reactions and these are real references that show this type of thing. I can't just willy nilly call, pull things and just say, well, maybe it does this, perhaps it does that, perhaps it does that. If you do that, you can get anywhere you wanna get. You really can. You know, you know, perhaps, perhaps if a, if a pig sat out in the sun long enough, perhaps it could start to spring wings and start flying around. Perhaps it could. You know, if, if you wanted to, perhaps it could, it could do this, it could do that. You can do that all day. You know, single point mutations, single point mutations could do that. If a pig sat around long enough and had an, enough single point mutations, it'd start flying around. Uh, so we build these nano cars. These nano cars move across surfaces. You can shine lights on them and these little motors go and they move across surfaces. So if you just look at the motor of the nano car, these are these Faringa motors. If you just look at, at one step in the synthesis, you just look at this one step in the synthesis that um, uh, we'll just focus in on this. And here we're cooling it to minus 10 and minus 15 degrees, first to five degrees, then minus 10, minus 15, then have to cool it down further to minus 50, do these reactions. And some reactions we're doing at low temperatures, some reactions we're doing at 130 degrees. This is we're doing at 60 degrees. Why, why on earth would we do that? Is it just because we like heating and cooling things? No, because we have to. You have to do that with chemistry. There's a lot involved in it. And so this is just one reaction to make that episulfide, that thing that was in the box. To an oven dried three neck round and bottom flask was charged with the hydrozone 33, 0.99 grams, 4.7 millimoles, magnesium sulfate was added, 0.49 grams, uh, dichloromethane, that's an organic solvent. Try to do all organic chemistry in water. Boy, it is that hard. That is very hard. It can be done, but it's hard. And uh, nature was restricted probably to mostly water. To the suspension was added quickly manganese oxide. Uh, and at, at five degrees, the reaction was immediately immersed and stirred in a cold bath ranging minus 15 to minus 10 for 1.5 hours. After this period, the reaction mixture was cooled to minus 50 and then transferred to a Schlenk filtration tube connected to an oven dried three neck round bottom flask. Why oven dried? Because if it had water on it, it kills the reaction. That's why. The deep purple filtrate that contained the intermediate was collected in a slant tube rinsed with pre-cooled dichloromethane. The flask contained the combined filtrate. Thion 35 was added portion-wise until no more nitrogen evolved. The mixture was stirred for an additional half hour at ambient temperature. The mixture was poured into methanol, stirred, and the white solid uh, uh, was obtained. And then you have, to, you have to put it through purification after that. It's pretty involved. Then you have to do the characterization because if you don't know that you have it, if you don't know what you have, you can't go on to the next step. So we use NMR. Earlier, it didn't do that. Nature uses enzymes, which, which come in and they clamp on on something and they recognize it. Is this the right thing? If it's not, you have other enzymes that will chew that up and make sure you get it out of the reaction mixture because if you have the wrong thing in there, it consumes the starting material for the next step and it immediately, within a couple steps, is just absolutely intractable. How do you deal with these separations? And then, then you, you, 
to characterize it, it's quite involved. This is, this is uh, uh, what we had to show to convince people in our field that we had what we suggested we had. And so a combination of standard uh, uh, deuterium, uh, I'm sorry, one, di uh, one dimensional proton C13 depth, uh, 135 and 13C experiments, C13 experiments with standard 2D, COSY, NOE, and other, other, these are long range coupling processes. So you can talk about the long range interaction. You've got to know this to be able to get the structure, but it doesn't stop here. There's, there's a lot here, but it doesn't stop here. Here's page two. You know, so th this, is, this is the same molecule. So it goes on. I mean, it, it, there's a lot here. How does this do this in nature? Well, you have to have a characterizing molecule, which is an enzyme. And generally the thing that is characterizing it is more complex than the thing that's being made. Nobody knows how this was done on an early earth. Nobody knows. And for those who think they do, they're wrong. They're just clearly wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. And the synthetic chemists here, they know. They know what I'm talking about. Characterization is essential. You don't know what, but in, in, for, for, for early earth, you don't know what, you're, there is no characterization, but you don't even know what you're going toward because you don't know that you're going toward life. You just don't know. Molecules never migrate toward life without a biological system acting on them. So for that one light-driven motorized nanocard had 281 pages of supplemental characterization data. 281 pages, that's a lot just to convince the world that we got what we suggested we got. And then that car only rotated, the motor only rotated at 1.8 revolutions per hour. But then the second generation, when you pull out that sulfur and close this ring down, that Feringa motor will spin at 3 million rotations per second. So how do you pull the sulfur atom out? You can't. There's no known chemistry to, to excise that. And, and, in a, and so on an early earth, how do you do it? Well, you got to go back to step one. You can't just modify structure. It can't be done. Very difficult to modify some structure. Uh, then you have the assembly experiments that make what they call protocells. A protocell is a self-organized, endogenously ordered spherical collection of lipid, lipids proposed as a stepping stone to the origin of life. And this liposome, which they call a protocell, which is, which is just the a lipid bilayer with water trapped in the middle. This, they say, is, you know, the essentially a protocell. You just, you know, take that, throw in a piece of RNA, and you essentially have life. That's utter nonsense. It's really garbage. Most so-called protocell experiments in origin of life research can be summed up by a protocol analogous to this. You purchase homochiral diacyl lipids, because remember all the natural lipids, the, the vast majority of them, these are, these are chiral. They have stereogenic centers at the, at the attachment point to uh, the glycerol. Uh, from a chemical company, or they synthesize stereoscramble, stereoscramble lipids <clears throat> from smaller molecules. They add those lipids to water and observe a small amount of it uh, uh, to, to form the simple expected thermodynamically driven assembly of those lipids into a synthetic bilayer vesicle upon agitation. Some researchers, researchers will add other molecules to get engulfed by the vesicle that forms. They publish a paper claiming that a synthetic vesicle is a protocell and suggestive of early forms of life, engage with the media to ramp up the hype and watch the lay person be misled. All right, so Look, a lipid bilayer has so much more than that, and even in a bacterium, so much more. And you say, well, it was simple. It was simple in earlier life. No, you still had to have things. You still had to have something that could allow certain ions to get through because you have to have an ionic gradient here for life. You can't let any trash into the cell that wants to swim by and get into the cell. And you, you had to keep what you had in there from going out, but you had to have certain things going in and out. How do you do that? Whether well, these transmembrane proteins that, that, that form these channels that allow certain things to go in and out. And then, and then uh, uh, synthetic vesicles uh, have none of this. Nobody ever builds synthetic vesicles with this kind of complexity. The, there, there's uh, lipid bilayers surround organelles within there. And they each have their own lipid bilayer component. The outer part of the membrane is different than the inner part of the membrane. But everybody just makes homogenous, uh, 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 
uh, um, homogenous ones. Why? Because they can't figure out how to make them so that you have the outside different than the inside. That later comes through enzymes where you can get flipase enzymes that can do that sort of thing. Protein liberate complexes are, are, are uh, um, required for the passive transport to go through. And then there's carbohydrates that extend all over the surface. So you have these glycoproteins and these carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are really complex. If you just consider a hexamer of D-pyranose or, or D-glucose, you can have over 1 trillion constitutional and stereochemical isomers from D-glucose or D-pyranose. Over 1 trillion isomers from the same monomer. Think about that. If you had, if you had six of the same amino acids, what are the different ways you can hook those together? Just one. A, 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 A. That's it. What if you had, you had six nucleotides, all the same nucleotides, you wanted to hook them together? What's the arrangement that you can have of those? One. If you have six of the same carbohydrates, just six, what's the ways you can hook that together? Over one trillion, it's 1.2 trillion ways. And uh, um, nobody knows how that was ever done. You get that thing wrong, the cell doesn't operate. There's more information can be stored in a carbohydrate assembly by far than in DNA. It's amazing. The sugars, the sugars win. You get that wrong, the cell dies. There's the interactomes, the non-covalent interactions. It is amazing, just amazing, the non-covalent interactions. Molecules transfer information non-covalently, and they're ordered, and they pass, they have a tremendous coherence length, and it's just the modification, the the, the movement of a molecular orbital just causing it to get larger on one side. So you bring in a charge here, it's larger ones. That affects the next MO next to it, the next molecular orbital next to it, and the next and the next with a very long coherence. And this is how information is transferred. It's called the interactome. An interactome is the whole set of molecular interactions in a particular cell. If one considers all protein-protein interactome combinations in just a single yeast cell, the result is an estimated 10 to the 79 billion. 10 to the 79 billion. I didn't calculate this, these guys did. Just to put that in perspective, there's 10 to the 90th estimated number of elemental particles in the universe. And you say, well, is that, is that atoms or is that electrons, protons, and neutrons? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're only talking a factor of, of 10 to 100 different. That's nothing in this. This number is crazy big. That number is like, you gotta be kidding me. You've gotta get these things right. And that's why you can't just dehydrate a cell and willy nilly try to recite, rehydrate that cell and think the cell's gonna come alive. It takes this information and it splits it between, between two cells. And this is how these cells just generate more cells. But that information, that non-covalent interaction, so much information is embedded in that. Nobody knows how these things came into the right order. And these authors don't know how. And their only explanation is, they says there's not enough time in the universe to do this. So what they go to is an infinite number of universes. Okay, you want an infinite number of universes? You know what an infinite number of universes means? That means there's another one of me in another universe and another one of you watching this through a Zoom webcast. It's just that I just moved my arm and in that other universe, they didn't move that, their arm that way and that made it a little bit different. Yeah, that's what you gotta come up with. All right. proto turkeys origin of life. Uh, uh, Proto-cell assembly is akin to buying 20 pounds of sliced turkey meat, adding a gallon of turkey broth, warming, sticking in a few feathers and suggesting that a live turkey will eventually come gobbling out if given enough time, or that a protocell or extant turkey has been synthesized. This is a bunch of nonsense. You know this. You're not going to get it. You're not going to throw turkey meat into a pot and cook it up and a turkey comes out. This is exactly what they do with the protocell experiment. They put RNA, they put some DNA in it. Well, there's a cell. It's not a cell. This is, this is not, there's no life there. Uh, origin of information, critical for life is the origin of information. We have no idea where the information code comes from because just sticking a bunch of nucleotides together is not RNA. It's not DNA. There's no information. It has to have a prescribed sequence any more than a 
box of random letters is a book. Try to get a box of random letters published. Try, go ahead, try. All right, try to build a cell even hypothetically. You assemble any dream team you want and, and, uh, and say, go ahead, have at it, make a cell. They'd, they'd laugh at you. And now <clears throat> they can't make a cell even if given the chemicals. So you give them all the chemicals in homochiral form and the information code. Say, so make a cell, can't do it. In 2010, Craig Venner's group copied an existing bacterial genome and transplanted it into another cell. 2016, so that and they did something similar. So you take the genome and you copy it and then you put it into an existing cell, bacterial genome, and you put it into an existing, uh, uh, in, into an, an existing cell. So, and you get this thing to go again, but that is like taking the, the computer control box out of one car, copying it, go to fab facility, copy it and put that in the car and say, hey, look, I made the car. No, you didn't make the car. You know how many pieces there are in a car? You took out one piece, you copied it, and you put one piece back in there. Venter did a similar thing. 2016, he knocked out all but 473 genes from the natural genome, transplanted it into another cell. And I guarantee you that second cell didn't work very well. But, you know, that's like taking the, the control chip and gouging out a few of the transistors and sticking it in and say, hey, see, look, the car still runs. Yeah, it runs, but it doesn't run well. Um, so how did life begin? So, so Jack Sostek, who's Nobel Prize winner at, uh, at Harvard, wrote this in Nature. And it's just filled with, with lots and lots of hype that makes no sense. It makes no sense. Life as we know it <clears throat> needs RNA. <clears throat> Some scientists believe that RNA emerged directly from these reactive chemicals nudged along by dynamic forces in the environment. This is in Nature in the news and views section where he is supposed to, to share with the, the scientifically knowledgeable person that does not work in origin of life. I have no idea what nudged along means. In synthetic chemistry, we never talk about nudge. We don't know what it means. Nucleotides, of, nucleotides the building blocks of, of RNA eventually formed. How? No explanation. This, but he, this is how he's telling us origin of life. Once that was made, some strands became enclosed in tiny vesicles. How did that happen? We don't know. You want to throw it into a pool with a high concentration and then let that pool evaporate? Okay, some will get stuck in there. As the membranes incorporated more fatty acids, they grew and divided at the same time. Internal chemical reactions drove replication. Oh, really? They drove replication of the encapsulated DNA. I'm sorry, RNA. So here's the picture that's shown. So he's got cyanide derivatives, simple sugars, even though this is, this is uh, you know, if you just look at this map, this, this, this is glycerol and this is ethylene glycol. These are not sugars. And uh, uh, for anything, it, it violates every convention to suggest that these are sugars. But anyway, we'll give it to them. These are simple sugars. And you take these cyanide derivatives, you take phosphate and you get what's RNA. But that's not RNA because RNA means ribose. There's no stereochemistry shown. So that's not RNA. But in any case, UV light drove conversion of cyanide into simple sugars. Oh, you want to show me that? Nobody knows how that's done. Tell that to Eschenmoser, who tried a long time to make sugars. Phosphate catalyzed chemical reaction between these sugars and cyanide derivatives. And in the presence of UV light and phosphate, RNA nucleotides were firm, formed. Are you kidding me? That, that, that's what we're told happened. Well, here's the steps that he's referring to. These are steps that are done by Sutherland in a, in a synthetic laboratory. So there's 12 synthetic steps at least that are shown here. And to suggest that you can just take those simple sugars, which we don't know how to get, and cyanide compounds, and you shine light and heat, and you're going to get this, is just not true. Not true at all. There's a lot of sophistication trying to carry this thing out. A lot with all sorts of, of input from the researchers, but just look at the procedures. Dihydroxyacetone, where did he get this? He bought it, he bought it. And, and uh, this phosphate compound were dissolved in water and there's a specific concentration here. It didn't just a little bit of this, a little bit of that. The resultant solution was degassed for 15 minutes. Why degassed? Because he had to get rid of the oxygen. 
Uh, oh, oh, early earth didn't have oxygen. Well, it had ammonia. So I don't see him bubbling ammonia into this thing because he's going to start getting imines. Um, uh, and, and so, so uh, then by degassed, he means he's bubbling nitrogen or argon. Then he takes sodium, uh, sodium hydrogen sulfide. It was added and it turned yellow. And then the sodium hydrogen sulfide uh, dissolved completely at pH 7. It was degassed uh, using, uh, using degassed um, uh, sodium hydroxide HCl mixture. Where are you going to get that? Degassed. The solution was then transferred to a quartz tube. Oh, how convenient, a quartz tube containing copper one cyanide and immediately sealed whereupon a black precipitate formed. The tube was placed in a rayonet reactor. You know what that is? That's a, that's a box with UV lights. Where are you gonna get that on an early earth? Oh, the sun provided that. Oh, but the sun turned off when you wanted it to turn off. If you have that much sunlight banging on this thing with UV light, your compounds are decomposing really fast. And he rated it for six hours. After that time, an aliquot was removed and examined by NMR. And then, uh, and, and then he, he used, so, so here's, here's the NMR that, that he got. Here's the NMR that he wanted. He just wanted to reduce, he just wanted to reduce that ketone and make that, that alcohol right there. This is what he wanted, this is what he got. It's really, really messy. He was able to pump on it, you know, so he could pump on it with a vacuum pump. Where did you get that on an early Earth? How did he, oh, it was in space, got injected up into space, and then it formed a vacuum. Oh, it formed a vacuum in space, but the, the triol that he wanted didn't evacuate? Hmm, that's interesting. And uh, um, so, so uh, uh, you, you know, you, you look at this and you think, what, what's going on here? What is he doing? And then... Does he ever use this that he made in this? No, 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 he doesn't. He goes out and buys a fresh sample of this and carries it on to the next step. So this is what happens. Origin of life researchers secret. This is their little secret. They do a relay synthesis over and over again to bypass low yields and purification difficulties. So you take A and B and you make, say you want to get AB4 out of this compound called AB4. Well, you also get AB1, AB2, AB3, AB5, AB6, AB7, all the way up to ABN. All right, so what do they do? They don't fish AB4 out of this. AB4 doesn't just fall out of this and say, I'm the one you wanted. No, they go and they synthetically make AB4 using organic solvents and modern reagents, or they purchase it. Generally, they purchase it. So you buy AB4 and you mix it with C to bring it on the next step. And you get AB4, C1, C2, C3. And they want this, but you get all, and they, they recognize this as a little blip in an HPLC. It's, 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 it's not homochiral, but they'll go out and they'll buy the enantiomer that they want. They'll buy that. And they bring it on to the next step over and over and over again. You don't do synthesis in a normal lab like that. That's cheating at every step. Every step is a cheat. All right, exquisite exactness in these protocols. So you look at John Sutherland's steps here. You know, you have copper one cyanide as a just suggested way. Copper one, so you have, uh, uh, so copper one, cyanoacetylene was made from copper one. So copper one chloride was mixed with potassium chloride to generate the Newlin catalyst. So you get this Newlin catalyst at 70 degrees. Then you generate acetylene gas by mixing calcium carbide with water. All right, so separately calcium carbide with water and you bubble that into there. How do you do this on an early earth? Through a Newlin catalyst and was prepared to make acrylonitrile. Acrylonitrile, you synthetic chemists know what I'm talking about. That's really unstable. And then he adjusted it to, to, to uh, uh, with five equivalents of ammonia as a 13 molar ammonia ammonium solution to adjust it to pH 9.2. That's pretty exact. How do you do that on a, I don't know. With sodium hydroxide to generate the desired amino propionitrile. All of these were separately executed in different, via, in different flasks. This is what we're talking about is just these initial first steps. Uh, where is it? Right here. You know, here, here here's a, uh, uh, propionitrile right here. Just these simple little steps. This is what we're talking about. Just these simple little molecules. He needed that kind of complexity. All right. And then he had 
look what he said in this article. All the cellular subsystem, subsystems could have been aris, could have arisen through common chemistry. These are cellular subsystems. These are molecules working together for some collective function. This is crazy. From that paper to say all of all all the cellular subsystems could have arisen simultaneously through common chemistry. You see how loosey goosey they are with their comments. This is crazy. Uh, how close have researchers come to making an artificial cell? Well, in November 2018, they told us. They told us in science. Science, they said, biologists create the most lifelike artificial cells. So let me digest this for you. Uh, so they're citing this publication. So what did, what did they do? They took, they took uh, uh, micro capsules that they made out of plastic. Yes, plastic that they made in a fabrication facility that had, they put clay in it because clay is positively charged, and that then they bought DNA and they put DNA in there. And then they also bought mRNA enzymes and reagents, and they put that in there. And that diffuses in those microcapsules because they're semi-porous. So these diffuse in, and then they start generating proteins. And then those proteins start coming out, they diffuse out, and they go into surrounding surrounding uh, uh, microcapsules, and they go into the surrounding microcapsules, and they call that quorum sensing. No, that's just diffusion. The capsules that are closer get more things diffusing in them. The capsules that are further away get less. That's not quorum sensing. It's just diffusion. Uh, the chemistry, the chemistry that they did is, 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 a, is the chemistry of the exogenously added reagents will work regardless of the container, whether it's a plastic semi-porous microcapsule in a test tube or in a large scale industrial production tank. Uh, um, one can buy this from a kit. You can buy a kit that does this. You buy all of these pieces. There's, there's no life here. This is just chemistry going on. And they did kit chemistry in a microporous capsule, and that's what is said is the most lifelike cell ever made, according to science. There's no life there. It's buying what's in a kit and doing it in a semi-porous capsule. That's life. That's the claim there. So that underscores that's that's the closest they've ever got. So they don't have life. Here's another one. This this. This layperson article, Researchers Solve Puzzle of Origin of Life on Earth. And somebody sent this to me. I was like, wow, they, they did? I didn't see this. I miss it. So they solved the puzzle. Wow, I got to read it. So I go back to the paper. Prebiotic amino acids bind to and stabilize prebiotic fatty acid membranes. That title doesn't sound like that title. All they did is they showed that magnesium 2 helps to assist in binding amino acids to stabilize fatty acid membranes. That's it. And that's the title they got out of it for the, the lay press. And so what do these researchers do? So, so see here, these researchers, so you have uh, um, uh, Roy Black and his coworkers. So what, do, what does uh, Dr. Black do and his coworkers? They are taking membranes and they pack up in these membranes, RNA and proteins, okay? So you, you buy RNA, you buy proteins, and you stick them in there. And now what? Now what? Well, that's, that's sort of a cell, right? No, it's not. So there's no life. Nothing happens there. So you take trash, you turn it into other trash, you turn it into other trash. All of a sudden, you claim life. But it's just a bunch of trash. It's just a bunch of trash. It's really all it is. Now, I'm, I'm wrapping up here because I never mentioned God in this whole thing. I don't have to mention God to, to talk about how ridiculous this stuff is. But I am not a, a proponent of God of the gaps. In other words, as a scientist, I would never say that we will never understand. One day in the distant future, we might understand life's origin and evolution of a complex system. As a believer in Jesus, that would do nothing to me other than that will not lessen God, but we will see him as all the more magnanimous. Oh, that's how you did it. You know, so, so, you know, nothing is going to shake my faith. My faith is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I don't need any of that to tear apart this origin of life chemistry. But I don't use God of the gap arguments. I just say, I don't know how it did. One day we might know. But as of today, we are nowhere close. Okay, so if you went to drjamestour.com, you would see this page. 
you can go to, to my YouTube channel. So you go to my YouTube channel from there, which is just DR James tour on YouTube. And, and, uh, uh, I just started this site and I'm just going to be coming out. I have a, I've had a few interviews on there, but I'm just going to blitz next month. I'm going to come out with 10 videos tearing apart origin of life. And I'm having a grand time. And I got, if you thought I got excited right now, Oh, you should see me on the, that thing. Cause I, I was all alone in my office fuming because of uh, some claims of, of, uh, people that, that were supporting origin of life experiments that knew nothing about the experiments that had even been done. And so, so um, uh, anyway, that'll come out next month in the middle of, of, uh, of November. So if you just go to DR James tour on YouTube and subscribe, you'll get a ding when those things come out and which is going to be day after day after day after day, you, you'll get 10 of them plus a few interviews on that. And uh, you'll have plenty to focus in on. So I will end there. Jim, thank you very much for that. I'm going to ask David Williams if he'd like to come in and uh, maybe just take a little bit of discussion at this point before we ask Steve to give us his talk. David. Thanks, Jim. That was fantastic. And just for the viewers, be about five minutes or so of Q&A and then Steve will come in with his talk. Can I kick it off with a question that's come on YouTube, Jim, that is arising out of the comment you made about uh, comparing the information carrying content or capability of uh, carbohydrates with DNA. Um, and the question is, you mentioned more information can be stored in carbohydrates and cell walls compared to DNA. It goes on to say there are chains of on average 300 with 20 different amino acids. I think he's talking about a change of DNA. Uh, please give the two numbers for carbohydrates or how do you compare the numbers between information in carbohydrates and information in DNA? Oh, I, I, you know, I, I don't know the numbers, but I can tell you it is many, many, many orders of magnitude higher information can be stored in carbohydrate structure. In fact, the carbohydrates that are within a cell, sitting on the surface of a cell, don't come from the initial template because their structure is modified through the, the life of the cell. So there'll be other DNA from neighboring cells acting upon what's on the surface of that cell to modify them, to bring in more structural change as the cell develops, as it goes through its different cycles. The other thing is the, the membrane itself, is, as we're learning now, there, there's many different lipids that make up the membrane and those are swarming. These domains are moving around depending on what stage the cell is in. So this, this thing of, it's just a membrane. They're highly complex, but as far as as, as the information that can be stored in DNA, just remember the numbers I told you. If you have six of the same amino acids or six of the same nucleotides, there's only one way you can hook those together. But if you have six of the same sugar, that, 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 that's, a, that's a six carbon, a, a six ring sugar, then you have over, you have 1.2 trillion ways you can put that together. I mean, it's just, Orders of magnitude greater amount of information could be stored in carbohydrates if you wanted it to be. So when you want to build a DNA computer, if you really wanted to store more information, store it, store it in carbohydrates. The problem is carbohydrates synthesis is super, super hard. And I'm going to address that on my YouTube channel next month uh, because there were claims it's very simple. You just hook one group on the end and on the end. I'm going to show you what's involved in carbohydrate synthesis. This is with modern synthetic chemistry techniques. We have no idea how this was done in early life. I don't know if I answered your question, David. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks. Just two quick, two more quick ones, Jim, before we go on to Steve. Yeah, the Lee Cronin on the Unbelievable program you mentioned, and the questioner says he seemed awfully confident he was onto something and that he was going to win the $10 million, I think it was, Evolution 2 prize. Uh, how confident are you of his claim? Well, he might win the prize if, if the people who, 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 who give the prize give it for a bunch of nonsense that has nothing to do with life. Look, I highly respect Lee. He is the only origin of life researcher who would agree to speak with me, publicly speak with me. None of them will speak with me. What does that tell you? People don't want to really have deep discussions about their religion when they, when they question whether they can answer the question. But Lee met with me. And I studied his papers. He sent me his papers beforehand. And he's redefining life. He's trying to redefine life to say, I can make this redefinition of life 
but even his redefinition is, is it, it has nothing to do with life. He's, he's essentially saying you have this autocatalytic reaction and that's life. And that's why I told him autocatalytic reactions have been around for over a hundred years. That's not life. That you just generate something in there. That something then catalyzes a new reaction. That, that's, th this thing happens all the time. That's not life. If you want to redefine life into something and the, the committee buys it because he said that there's life, but if it has the characteristics of life that we know it, he's nowhere close, nowhere close. He's not going to win that $10 million if it has the characteristics of life as we know it. But if he wants to redefine life, that all it is is, is a, is a uh, autocatalytic reaction, then give it to Oswald uh, who died you know, in like the 1940s. Give it to him. He did the work in the 1920s. Give it to him. I um, I find myself unable to resist it's, uh, the um, amusing side of you saying it's not life as we know it, uh, Jim. But there we are. I'll I'll uh, I'll move on from that. Um, what uh, final question before we move on to Steve Meyer? And um, and it's this: the miller ure if that's how you pronounce it, experiment all those years ago. Can you just sum up for us? How much progress has been made since then in Origin of Life? Well, you, you know, I've, I've made, you're asking me. Yeah. Are you? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I've, I've made the conjecture that very little has been done in that every experiment is still generally generating a vast array of, 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 of compounds that are not separated from one another and that, that, uh, um, that, are not homochiral, that are racemic. But Miller-Urey in many ways is better than all the rest of them because he's made, if you go back and, you, and, and experiments have been done to try to duplicate this and even looking at his own solutions, he didn't have the analytical techniques for it back in the, in, in the early 50s, is that he made about 18 or 19 of the amino acids. So lots of them were made. So you got to give him a lot of credit. And, and uh, uh, but they were all, they were all, mixed together and, and, and not in, in, in a separable form and not in homochiral form. Today, they're not making as nearly as many possible good compounds. And uh, uh, so, so, really, so very little has been done, in my opinion, that is moving us toward origin of life to understand how life came about. These experiments are supposed, are supposed to help us to know how did life come about? And what's happening here is that, is that uh, uh, you look at it, we have no definition of how, what does it mean to be moving in the right direction? Are we any closer to life? These protocell experiments are a bunch of nonsense. This is just packing up a vesicle with something. And you think you put RNA in there and, and, and you buy a kit and you squirt that stuff in there and it starts generating proteins. The kit was made by chemists to do that. There's no life, it's just chemistry, it's called chemistry. And, and you do it in a, in, a little, in a little vesicle and then proteins, leak out of a, a vesicle. They were using plastic balls and, and it, it just leaked out. That was it. So I don't think very much because we don't even know what we're going to. We, we have no idea. So in my opinion. All right. Well, thanks ever so much, Jim. We'll leave it there for now just to let people know we're still doing Q&A after Steve's talk. So the questions that keep coming in on YouTube, there'll still be an opportunity to ask questions to Jim and Steve after Steve's talk. But I'll hand you back to uh, David Galloway and he can do a brief introduction so that we can then hear the second talk tonight from Steve Meyer. So, David. Sure, thanks, uh, David. And thanks very much, Jim, for that uh, very animated and uh, emotionally charged uh, tour around that topic. Steve, we're delighted that you're with us. We're delighted, actually, that you had suggested that you might be able to twist Jim's arm to come and join us this evening. But it's a great pleasure to welcome you back to the C4ID community in the United Kingdom, and we're really looking forward to what you have to say. So over to you for your talk, and then it'll be back to David for some further discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Right, excellent. Yes, thank you to you all for inviting me and for Jim's excellent talk. Um, I'm going to be. Uh, Jim has done a deep dive on the on the synthetic chemistry and what it has to show us about the plausibility of origin of life research and particularly the simulation experiments that are touted in the science press. I want to talk a bit more about the logic of those experiments. Um, and I want to put the whole discussion of the origin of life in a larger context. 
because I think it will help us uh, evaluate uh, not only the claims that are made by uh, chemical evolutionary theorists, but also the competing argument that I and others have developed for, the, for intelligent design. In a way, the uh, talk that I'm giving is a complement to what Jim has just described. Jim has provided a very compelling critique of origin of life research. I wanna show how one could make a positive case for intelligent design based on things we've discovered about the cell without committing a, uh, an argument from ignorance or a God of the gaps type of uh, fallacy. Uh, but to do that, I wanna just make sure everyone is uh, oriented. If we think about evolutionary theory, we really think about two different types of, or, or branches of evolutionary theory. Biological evolution attempts to explain the origin of new forms of life from simpler pre-existing forms and chemical evolutionary theory or uh, chemical abiogenesis attempts to explain the origin of the very first life from, the, from simpler non-living chemicals. And that's of course what Jim's been talking about. So if we put this in the, the context of uh, Darwin's famous picture of the tree of life, uh, biological evolutionary theory is concerned with where, how the branches diversify from, from a single common trunk or root, the origin of the first life, which is our subject today, discusses how does that first living cell, which is allegedly the root of the great Darwinian tree, ar arise in the first place. And uh, I, I'm, some of you may know I did my PhD work in origin of life biology, and my, one of my Cambridge supervisors, Harmke Kaminga, who had studied the history of the field of origin of life research to that point, uh, said that <clears throat> memorably, that at the heart of the problem of the origin of life was a fundamental question. What is it exactly that we're trying to explain the origin of? And the confusion about this is the, is the very thing that Jim keeps running up against among origin of life researchers, where they wanna, in a sense, define down to some hypothetical entity, a self-replicating RNA molecule, for example, <clears throat> or an autocatalytic cycle. They wanna redefine life in some hypothetical way that <clears throat> makes it easier to explain life's origin. Excuse me. <clears throat> the, the problem with that, of course, is that we ultimately have to explain life as we know it because life as we know it is what is here on our planet. And we want to explain what is, we want to explain the systems that are here and how they got here. So uh, imagining, as Fred Hoyle did, that life might exist uh, in some sort of uh, gas cloud in outer space or that life might be made of silicon rather than carbon based molecules. That's all well and good, but at the end of the day, we still have to explain the systems that are here before us, the living cell that, as we know it. How did that arise? That's the ultimate objective of origin of life research. And, um, and as a result of that, um, the, the most comprehensive theories of the origin of life have always involved multi-step processes, starting from uh, simple gases as raw materials and energy source, um, as in the Miller-Urey experiment, uh, the energy source zapping the simple gases and producing the monomers, the sugars, the phosphates, and the bases of DNA, the amino acids of proteins, and then somehow um, suggesting that there were various chemical processes that caused those monomers to be linked together into polymers. The polymers were eventually enclosed into some sort of cell membrane or protocellular membrane, and then so, some kind of uh, evolutionary process ensued, some kind of competition between the cell membranes, and then they, through un some unspecified, usually unspecified process, uh, gradually complexified and became uh, similar to and eventually identical to the living cells we have today. In other words, origin of life researchers have recognized the imperative of, of eventually accounting for the types of cells we see on planet Earth today. Now, this was a this this depiction on my screen is of the uh, original scenario of Alexander Oparin, who wrote the the first major books on on the chemical evolutionary origin of life in the 1920s and 30s. Um, as Jim's pointed out, a number of researchers today have realized that this is actually a pretty tall order, and so what they've done is try to focus on some one aspect of this process, some simple step that they can. Uh, replicate, albeit often with uh, their own intelligent intervention, um, rather than trying to explain cells as we know them to exist. And so uh, <clears throat> I think we really need to be clear that a, a comprehensive and adequate explanation of the origin of life 
would actually address the origin of the cell itself. Now, <clears throat> the Miller-Urey experiment is very interesting. And I'm gonna come back to this at the end of the talk because I think the logic of these experiments is really important to understand. The idea of Miller-Urey beyond zapping the, the, uh, the allegedly um, reducing gases that were simulating the prebiotic atmosphere is precisely the idea that what you're doing in the laboratory in some way would be simulating some chemical process that would have or could have taken place on the early earth. In so doing, you're, you are taking advantage of the uh, uniformitarian reasoning that's employed in all the historical sciences. Uniformitarian reasoning says that the cause and effect processes we observe today would have been present in the, in the remote past. And therefore, if we can observe a cause and effect process today that produces the effect that we're trying to explain in the present, we can invoke such a process at work in the past. And this was the idea of the Miller-Urey experiment. He was trying to show how amino acids could be synthesized under plausible prebiotic conditions. People who have followed this literature in the field and who certainly anyone who's read any of my books will know that there are many problems with the simulation, this particular simulation experiment as well as all others. The Miller-Urey has been questioned by other uh, people in origin of life biology because the gases that were chosen uh, we now know didn't, do not simulate the atmospheric conditions on the early earth. Uh, your, Miller and Urey chose highly reducing gases. We now know that the, the composition of the early earth's atmosphere was either neutral or oxidizing and under such conditions, uh, amino acids would not form readily. Um, but in any case, we'll come back to this later in, in the talk because I really wanna dive into this logic of simulation experiments because I think you've seen just in listening to Jim, that if you um, very carefully get into the experimental protocols of those who are conducting these simulation experiments, you find a lot of active verbs. Uh, and I, I wrote a list as Jim was talking, purchase, mix, add, remove, immerse, cool, order, obtain, redesign, control, characterize, transfer, stop, input, et cetera. Uh, something is going on but pure chemistry in these simulation experiments. And at the end of my talk, I want to suggest that that something is actually very important for understanding the, uh, the origin of life and for coming to the best explanation of the origin, for example, of the information necessary to produce life. Something more than mere chemistry is being simulated here. And I think uh, many chemists are, are um, have become inert or blind to the influence of their own intelligent intervention into these experiments, but more on that later. Um, in any case, because people recognized, origin of life researchers have recognized that to explain the origin of life, you have to explain what actually exists in the cell. Uh, <clears throat> there's been a great emphasis on explaining the large bio macromolecules that make um, uh, cellular life possible. In particular, the origin of proteins, with their wonderful three-dimensional structures and their, uh, that are, are produced as a result of their subunits, the amino acids, being sequenced in very specific ways so as to produce specific three-dimensional structures that can, uh, in the case of enzymes, for example, uh, catalyze reactions at rates much faster than would occur without the presence of these enzymes. Uh, there's a, one of the key features of proteins is their, is their beautiful three-dimensional, the 3D specificity, that they have a three-dimensional hand and glove fit with other molecules to which they bind or, uh, <clears throat> or otherwise um, to other molecules um, whose reactions they catalyze. And this three-dimensional specificity is crucial to their function and crucial to maintaining cellular life. The proteins are the, the, the toolbox of the cell. They perform all the important functions. They, they <clears throat> catalyze reactions at rates faster than would otherwise occur. They uh, form the structural parts of molecular machines. They process the information in, uh, in DNA and RNA. So proteins are critical to life and therefore original life researchers have wondered how could proteins have arisen. They know in present day cells that proteins arise as the result of amino acids being pr precisely sequenced in accord with the, with the instructions uh, encoded on the DNA molecule. 
uh, that there is a sequence specificity to those th those amino acid uh, the, the the amino acid chains the, uh, that form the proteins are uh, are able to form those proteins because of a, a specific sequencing of the, those amino acid subunits those residues and <clears throat> as a result of discoveries during the molecular biological revolution the, it was it was determined that the sequence specificity in the in the amino acids that allows the chains to fold into beautiful three-dimensional structures that will perform functions in cells was in turn the product of sequence specific arrangement of bases or nucleotide bases along the spine of the DNA molecule. And this was the, the great insight of Francis Crick in 1957 and 1958 when he formulated the sequence hypothesis. Previously, he with Watson had, just, had elucidated the structure of the DNA molecule, but in 1957, Crick formulated this idea that the bases along the spine of the, in, the along the interior of the molecule uh, that denoted here with the A's, C's, G's, and T's, that those nucleotide bases are actually functioning like alphabetic characters in a written language or the digital characters, the zeros and ones in a section of software, which is to say that the, the arrangement of the bases is what is responsible for the function of the section of DNA that we call a gene, that the, the precise arrangement of those bases in accord with an independent symbol convention, le later discovered and elucidated as the gen genetic code, uh, that, that se those sequence of bases are literally carrying information or instructions for building the proteins. And so naturally, focus, a lot of focus of original life research then has uh, been directed towards explaining the origin of the DNA the RNA and the proteins, the system of information storage and transmission that makes life possible. And, uh, <clears throat> when, and, and so that, that's been a big focus because origin of life researchers have understood that part of the imperative of their discipline is to been to explain the origin of life as we find it, not a hypothetical autocatalytic system or something of that sort. Now, one point of clarification, just very briefly, many of you have uh, heard some of my talks or read my books will be aware of this. It's very important to, to define the kind of information that's present in life. Again, we want to explain, uh, the, the, we want to explain life as we find it. So we want to know what kind of information is present. And a, a crucial analytical distinction is the distinction between Shannon information, which is uh, an expression of the, uh, uh, the reduction of uncertainty that occurs with a, a sequence of symbols, and that turns out to be uh, inversely related to the probability of a, of a, of a particular sequence of symbols. But <clears throat> Shannon and his uh, co-author, um, Richard Weaver, from the very beginning of the molecular, or from the very beginning of the information revolution, made clear that their measure of information, their measure of effe effectively improbability or a reduction of uncertainty uh, did not capture the idea of meaning or function. So a, a crucial distinction that's been made within origin of life research itself, first by the prominent origin of life researcher, Leslie Orgel, is the distinction between complexity, which, or, which we can think of in a, if we're thinking of a string of characters as equivalent to improbability. Uh, so the distinction between complexity or improbability on the one hand and what Orgel called specified complexity on the other. And you can see that the distinction or I illustrated here qualitatively by looking at these two strings. At the top of the string, you see the string of characters. looks like random gibberish that any old monkey at a typewriter could have banged out. And the string at the bottom, which clearly has in addition to, which clearly in addition to being improbable, and complex is specified to perform a function. In other words, the arrangement of the individual elements of the sequence are critical to the, the, the function of the whole sequence. This is a communication function that's being performed here in the line of poetry, time and tide wait for no man. So you can see that there's a, there's a, there's a qualitative extra information theoretic element present in the second that's not in the first, and that that is what original life researchers have called specificity, what we might call in a linguistic context meaning, or in a broader context that would subsume both the idea of function. So what we have in, in, in the living, in the DNA molecule, 
as in a section of computer code or as in a section of written meaningful English text is not just information, but in, a, in the Shannon sense, but functional or specified information or what our colleague William Dembski has called complex specified information. Now, interestingly, one of the first people to recognize this was Francis Crick himself. He was writing, and this is a quotation from 1958. He's writing in the immediate wake of, first of all, his own discovery with Watson of the, of the structure of the DNA molecule, but also in the immediate wake of this information revolution that's going on in the information sciences with Shannon's development of information theory. And, and Crick, to clarify, the kind of information that's present in DNA and RNA and protein says, by information, I mean the specification of the amino acid sequence in the protein. And then he goes on to, dis, to, to clarify the case of the nucleic acids, he says, information means here the precise determination of sequence, either of the bases in the nucleic acids in the DNA and RNA, or the precise specification of sequence of amino acid residues in the protein. So he's saying we're not in biology, we don't just have Shannon information, we don't just have a string like the, the top string of characters in this slide, but we have information in the sense of a precise arrangement of characters that performs a function. And that then has become the focus of, of a, a great deal of interest in origin of life biology. In fact, Bernd Olaf Coopers, the origin of life researcher from uh, Germany has said that the problem of the origin of life is clearly basically equivalent to the problem of the origin of biological information, where again, biological information is understood to be specified information or functional information, not mere Shannon information, not mere complexity, but specified complexity. Now, <clears throat> in my work, what I've done is look at proposed naturalistic explanations for the origin of the information that is clearly necessary to explain the origin of life. And I, I would amplify a comment that Jim was making in the Q&A. The information in DNA, RNA, and proteins is clearly necessary, but it is not sufficient. It turns out that there's additional information, uh, the car carbohydrates, the, 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 li the lipid membrane uh, is extremely, the lipids in the membrane are extremely important. Our colleague at uh, Weizmann Institute, Tony Fuderman, is doing some very interesting work on the information carrying capacity of, of lipids and, and glycolipids. So I'm, I'm looking at in this uh, presentation, just the information necessary in the DNA, RNA, protein uh, information uh, um, trans, trans, transmission system. But there have been three basic approaches to explain the origin of that information and the origin of life. And they flow from the work of Jacques Minot or the kind of philosophy of science that Jacques Minot articulated in his famous book in 1968, Chance and Necessity. Minot, Minot had worked with Crick and was very much part of the molecular biological revolution. And he said that if you're going to, if you're going to be a scientist and you want to explain things, you've got to explain things either by chance, stochastic processes, by necessity, by which he meant law-like processes that produce the same outcome every time by, as it were, necessity. You drop a ball, it falls to the earth. You can say it fell under the force of gravity by necessity. Or he says, you can combine chance and necessity. And interestingly, as I've been studying the literature on the origin of life for now uh, 35 years, uh, it turns out that every approach to explain the origin of life, at least within a materialistic framework, has attempted, can either be characterized as one that relies on chance, one that relies on necessity, or one that relies on the, on the combination of the two. Now, in my talk today, I don't have time to look at all the different theories in each of these different categories. Uh, I can tell you that the approach of relying on pure chance, which was popular in the 1950s, has really been rejected almost universally by origin of life researchers, in part because the probabilities associated with even uh, generating a simple, a relatively modest length protein by random chemical interactions of simpler monomers on the pre in a prebiotic soup or ocean, the, the probabilities associated with that are vanishingly small. And uh, the Scottish origin of life researcher in the 1970s summed it up saying that blind chance is very limited, low levels of cooperation, by which he means or, or organization or information, chance can produce exceedingly easily, the equivalent of a few letters or small words, 
but he, but Chance, he's personifying Chance, can become very quickly incompetent as the amount of organization and information increases. So most origin of life researchers have simply rejected the pure chance approach. Many in the 1960s, late 60s and 70s adopted a, what's called a self-organizational approach. I have two uh, chapters on that in Signature in the Cell. I'm not gonna talk about it today. For a while, it was the, really the hot, um, exciting thing in origin of life research, but it's really failed um, <clears throat> for a number of reasons that I explain in, in, uh, in Signature in the Cell and can address in Q&A. But wh where the action seems to be today is on reviving a notion that was originally rejected in the late 1960s called prebiotic natural selection. And you can see quickly why it was rejected. Uh, no, no less a person in evolutionary theory than Theodosius Dobzhansky said that prebiological natural selection is a contradiction in terms. What did he mean? Well, the whole idea of, of uh, prebiotic natural selection is that before you have a living organism, their natural selection is operating to uh, select differentially those modes of, of chemical organization that are more complex and more life uh, relevant than those that are not. The problem with this that occurred to almost all evolutionary biologists right away was that, that uh, natural selection depends upon a mechanism of self-replication. And in all living organisms, self-replication self and therefore differential reproduction rather, uh, self-replication depends upon sequence specific sections of DNA and proteins that process the information on the DNA strand. And yet that begged an obvious question. Where did this DNA, the, the, the sequence specific DNA and proteins come from? That's the, th those entities were the very thing that origin of life researchers were trying to explain. So in other words, you want to, you want to get self natural selection going, you've got to have some mechanism of, of, of self-replication, of, of, of self-reproduction, and that takes place in current cells as the result of DNA replication mediated by protein enzymes, uh, polymerases and the like. And yet those are the very molecular entities that need to be explained to explain the origin of life. So this approach didn't seem to be going anywhere. But recently, as Jim has noted, uh, people have defined life down, not instead of thinking that um, you need to explain the origin of life itself, maybe you could just explain the origin of a self-replicating molecular system, including one perhaps that might store information. And so a prebiotic natural selection approach has been uh, re revivified, resurrected uh, under the heading of the RNA world. And the idea of the R RNA world is already indicated is that through a series of steps, um, the simple uh, building blocks of RNA, the sugars, the phosphates, the bases come together on the early earth. They arrange themselves into a stable RNA molecule. Some of those RNA molecules uh, by whatever process also had the, nucle the information carrying bases arranged properly so that those RNA molecules, and this would be, if you look at my little diagram, step one is, is the synthesis of the monomers, the, the building blocks. Step two is the arrangement, the building of the molecule. Step three is the molecule beginning to copy itself. And at that point, many origin of life researchers say, well, there you have a kind of proto-life where natural selection could kick in, that the, that the, uh, the RNA could function as a template for copying itself and then, the, and then the molecules thus produced would have enough variation that some kind of selection and mutation process would kick in. And at, at that point, then you could uh, eventually develop life based on that kind of a process. And there are a number of other steps. You have to shift from um, RNA-mediated uh, synthesis of proteins to an RNA plus protein ribosome uh, mediated system of, of protein synthesis. Nobody really knows exactly how that happened, but in any case, the idea is you could start with this simple self-copying RNA molecule. Now, does that solve the ultimate problem of the origin of information? It turns out that it doesn't. Uh, the RNA world advocates envision an RNA molecule arising that's capable of copying itself, but <clears throat> to engineer uh, such replicators, it turns out that the, 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 the origin of life researchers who call themselves ribozyme engineers 
interestingly, have to actually sequence the RNA basis in a very specific way in order to get any self-replication capability going. So to get the, to, to, and, and what they've been able to achieve in the laboratory is a very modest sort of self-replication where they get, uh, they, they build an RNA molecule as a template and then they get it to copy itself, it, but only if they sequence the bases very specifically. And the, the degree of self-replication that's been achieved so far is only 10% of the, of the original molecule. So it's very limited self-replication. But interestingly, it depends upon pre-existing information. In other words, spe sequence specific RNA bases. Moreover, in all ribozyme engineering experiments, the basis has been sequenced by the intelligent investigators. So keep that in mind. We'll come back to that point later. So in, other, in, in, in any case, there are many, many problems with this RNA world uh, hypothesis. At every step of the way, there are chemical implausibilities. But as an explanation for the origin of information, it fails because even the earliest um, self-replicator that they envision would require pre-existing unexplained information to get self-replication possible. And that's been demonstrated by the very experiments that have attempted to produce such molecules. So very interesting. Now there are other informational requirements at each step of the way to get from RNA mediated protein synthesis to RNA plus protein plus DNA plus ribosome mediated synthesis, you've got to have a lot of, of information in the, in the RNA transcripts to build all the parts that would be necessary for that more complex system of the kind that we have in cells today. I go into all of that in my, in my book, uh, Signature in the Cell, and show that the informational requirements that are glossed over in these RNA world hypotheses are enormous. And they are, to the extent that they're ever solved at all, they are always solved by the intelligent investigators. We'll, we'll, we'll do more on that. There's just a little list of all the parts you would need to produce that, uh, the kind of translation system we have in, in uh, cells today. Uh, in any case, uh, no less a origin of life researcher than Christian de Duve, Nobel laureate, said that these theories of prebiotic natural selection need, they have a fatal flaw. They need information which implies they have, to be, they have to presuppose what is to be explained in the first place. He said, by the way, he applied this to the RNA world as well, saying that no one has figured out how to hitch together, he said, the, the, the bases that, make, uh, that would make an RNA uh, um, replicator possible. All right, so we've got a big problem in origin of life research. It's the problem of the origin of information, whether we think of that in terms of a DNA first, an RNA first, or a protein first model the origin of information has remained unsolved and has grown ever more acute as, as, uh, as, as researchers have looked at it. Now, I've been aware of the, 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 the impasse in origin of life research since I first went to grad school in the 1980s. And uh, as I was doing work on origin of life biology and the methodology of these origin of life simulation experiments and the historical sciences more gradually, I began to formulate a question in my mind, which was, could a design hypothesis be formulated in a rigorous uh, scientific manner? Could the design hypothesis be made a, uh, could, it, could it be developed as a rigorous uh, scientific argument? Uh, in other words, do we need to be limited to chance, necessity, or the combination of the two? Because even by the time I was working on my PhD in the late eighties, it was clear that that origin of life researchers were simply recycling these different approaches and never making any progress. And it suggested to me that maybe nature was telling us something. Maybe as, as Jim has said, the, the, the chemicals don't want to move in life-friendly directions. And that to get them to move in life-friendly directions, there needs to be an imposition of intelligence. Now, as I formulated this question, I, I began to explore the methods of first origin of life biology, and then in a broader sense, historical sciences. Um, there's uh, the kind of science that uh, most uh, physicists and chemists and even biologists are familiar with is the sort of bench science or field science where you can observe things in the present, replicate certain phenomena under controlled conditions. But when we're trying to reconstruct what might have happened a long time ago to cause certain events to occur or certain systems to originate, we do not have the luxury of replicating uh, the exact event in, uh, in real time under controlled laboratory conditions. 
Simulation experiments are an attempt to do that, and I'll get to that in a bit. But the main point is that we're trying to explain things in the remote past. We need to use a different method of reasoning. And Darwin himself characterized this method as a method that emphasized explanatory power as a way of adjudicating between competing hypotheses. I won't read this whole quote, it's in my book, but Darwin um, defended his theory against physicists who thought that it wasn't proper science by saying, no, I'm, I'm using a method that's known in the sciences of comparing competing hypotheses by reference to their explanatory power. And on that basis, he thought his, his theory would win out. Now, when I was uh, in the, the second to last year of my PhD work, a young American professor came to do a, a, a job talk at Cambridge named Peter Lipton. And he'd done his DPhil at Oxford on this method of reasoning known as inference to the best explanation. And he later published a book on this. At the time when he had come to, to uh, Cambridge, he shared with me the unpublished manuscript that was later published and has become something of a minor classic in the philosophy of science. Lipton later rose to become the, the, the chairman of the Department of, of History and Philosophy of Science in Cambridge uh, until he, he died just a few years ago, sadly. In any case, uh, Lipton's work, as well as the work of Darwin and many of the other 19th century um, historical scientists really influenced my thinking about what's going on in origin of life research. And basically the method of reasoning that historical scientists use can be characterized with a couple of different titles. It can be called the, multi the method of multiple competing hypotheses. Many geologists uh, describe their method using that term or the method of inferring to the best explanation, the best explanatory hypothesis. And what um, historical scientists tend to do is that if they wanna explain an event in the remote past, they posit multiple possible causes and then they, they evaluate each and they infer that cause which if true or actual or existent in the past would best explain the event in question. And so they posit multiple possible causes, multiple possible causal hypotheses. They eliminate those causes which do not provide an adequate explanation. And then they elect the one or the remaining ones that do as the best or better such explanations. Uh, in the best case, there's only one remaining plausible explanation. Now, all this begs a certain question, which is, what does it mean to be the best explanation? If we're gonna say uh, that this method of reasoning posits that cause which if true or actual would best explain uh, the, uh, the event in question, that does beg the question, well, what does it mean to best explain the event? And the key criterion that both the philosophers of science and the actual historical scientists have, have settled on is that of ca causal adequacy. And I first came across this in the work of Charles Lyell, the famed geologist, who was one of Darwin's mentors. And, and this was in the subtitle of his famous book, Principles of Geology. At the very end, he says, that the, the, the study of uh, geology, he said, is it, he said, being an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. And this was the idea behind his famous dictum, the present is the key to the past, his uniformitarian dictum, that what we're looking for in the historical sciences is a cause that's operating now in the present that we can assume would have been operating in the past and therefore can help us reconstruct what did happen in the past. And so as I began to think about this, I asked myself, well, what is the cause now in operation for the production of information, the production of in in particular, digital code of the kind we find in the DNA molecule or the RNA molecule. And um, as I was thinking about this, I was also reading works on the application of information theory and information sciences, information concepts to molecular biology. And as I did, I came across a passage in a book uh, written by an early pioneer in this field known, uh, named Henry Quassler. And he made an offhand comment that the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. And I began to think about that and thought, well, are, do we know of any counterexamples to that? We have this problem, this unsolved problem of the origin of information and origin of life research. But what do we know about the origin of information generally? Where does information generally come from? What, 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 to what process, what process uh, to what processes do we habitually associate the cre creation of information? And 
Quassler says, we always see it with conscious activity. And I thought, well, is, is that true in our ordinary experience? Well, if you think of, you could think of a number of examples. Um, our our, our um, uh, software engineering uh, hero up here in, in Seattle, Bill Gates, it says that D DNA is like a software program, only much more complex than any we ever created. We know that software arises from a mind. Um, we, in fact, we know whenever we find information and we trace it back to its source, whether we see it in a hieroglyphic in inscription or a paragraph in a book or a newspaper headline or whether the information is embedded a radio, in a radio signal or whether it's in a section of software. Whenever we find information and trace it back to its ultimate source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. And so based on the same kind of uniformitarian reasoning that Darwin used in The Origin of Species, that Lyell used in his works in geology, and in fact, that all historical scientists use, I think it's a very reasonable inference to conclude that the information necessary to produce the first life also had an intelligent source. Now notice that is, uh, that is a, a scientific inference insofar as it's using the very same method of reasoning that Darwin used in The Origin of Species or that Origin of Life researchers use or that uh, other historical scientists such as geologists and archeologists use. We're looking at an effect that needs to be explained, specified complexity or specified information in my book, Signature in the Cell, I self-consciously employed this method by looking at all the different types of origin of life uh, scenarios, ex proposed explanations, whether they be based on chance, necessity, the combination of the two, or I included the possibility of intelligent design. And then I asked the question of these different, um, uh, of the, the, the causal processes invoked by these different scenarios, which are known to be sufficient to produce information. And I found that only one of those approaches posited a cause which was known in our present experience to produce information. In other words, uh, uh, um, the, a cause, the only cause now in operation that we know of that produces specified complexity or specified in information, especially when we find it in a digital or alphabetic form, is intelligence. It's a mind, not an undirected material process. So by applying the same method of reasoning that Darwin used in The Origin of Species, that Lyell used in his works in geology, that origin of life biologists use in their simulation experiments, I've come to a very different conclusion, that intelligent design provides the best, most causally adequate explanation for the origin of the information necessary to produce the first life. Now, I wanna circle back now, it, this is, we're now to the very end of the talk, but I wanna circle back to this uh, th these simulation experiments that Jim has critiqued so powerfully. And again, point out the logic of these experiments is very much Lyellian, Darwinian, it's uniformitarian. In other words, what the, the origin of life researchers are trying to do is to identify some step along the way from the simplest uh, chemical precursors to a living cell and set up an experiment that would, uh, that would allegedly or putatively simulate conditions on the early earth and then see what would happen. And if they can produce something that moves the chemistry in a life friendly or life tropic direction, they will claim success. Now it might just be one tiny step along the way. And it might also be that conditions were chosen that don't match the uh, conditions on the early earth. And on those two grounds, you can say that these experiments either may not be that significant or they may not be significant at all if they haven't simulated early earth conditions. But notice the logic. The logic is they're trying to, they're trying to simulate in the present the causes in operation that would produce the effect in question or some step along the way to the effect in question. Now, what's really interesting, and I think we should not uh, that we should take note of and we should not ignore is that in every single case where these simulation experiments have produced anything interesting, whether it's uh, one of the RNA bases or an amino acid or um, a carbohydrate, uh, and, and again, many of these experiments have not produced interesting things, but to the extent they've been successful at all, 
they have invariably involved the intelligent intervention of the experimenter. So, so often, in fact, that this is a known part of origin of life research, the problem of investigator interference. Now, I wanna say that the problem of investigator interference, which is ubiquitous, and again, Jim does the, the best job of anyone of, of exposing this. And I, I get just for maybe slightly for humor's sake, again, these are just the active verbs that I wrote down during his talk as he was describing these experimental protocols of the different, the different uh, simulation experiments. Purchase, reagents that are already commercially produced, mix, order, immerse, cool, stop reactions, restart them at the right time, obtain, redesign, control, transfer, characterize, all of the pump, all of these active verbs that are present in, uh, that, that, that uh, are part of, that describe the origin of life simulation experiment. All of these active verbs have a subject with them. And the subject is often not spoken. So oftentimes in the origin of life papers, the, 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 the use of the, pa the passive voice is used. But the, who's doing the purchasing, mixing, ordering, obtaining, redesigning, controlling, transferring, stopping, et cetera, characterize it? It's an intelligent agent. It's the, it's the organic synth synthesizer. It's the organic chemist who's doing the synthesis. And without the intervention of the intelligent agent, no progress is made in moving the chemistry towards anything that's life-friendly. And I think that's nature telling us something. In other words, I wanna ask a question, what is being simulated here? I think what's being simulated and has been simulated over and over again by ribozyme engineers or other origin of life researchers is the indispensable role of intelligence in constraining possibilities to produce a desired outcome. In other words, what's being simulated here is a teleological process. The investigators know the outcome they want, the kind of outcome they want, and they constrain the chemistry, whether it's by the, the reaction products or the reagents they choose, or by, by the, the clever use of chemical traps, or by removing certain byproducts of their simulation experiments to prevent interfering cross reactions in this Miller-Urey experiment, for example, uh, in the trap, there were, there were amino acids, some of the protein forming amino acids, but there were many, many other chemical, uh, chemical substances that would react with those amino acids to form a non-life uh, relevant sludge called melanoidin. And to, to get the experiments to go any further, uh, original life researchers have always had to find a way to either remove those, or as Jim pointed out, they can sometimes just uh, start a new experiment with the, with the the, the chemicals they want, uh, knowing that, that they were produced in a previous uh, experiment, albeit with a lot of other chemistry that would interfere. So anytime an experimenter intervenes to say, I want this and not that, they are by the basic axioms of information sciences imparting a bit of information. And yet there are multiple interventions necessary to move these experiments along. And so that I think is telling us something. What, in other words, what's being simulated? I think what's clearly being simulated is the need for intelligence in order to move the chemistry in a life-friendly direction, and certainly the need for intelligence to generate information, information that's necessary to constrain degrees of mathematical freedom, to constrain degrees of chemical freedom, to move things in a teleological direction. So <clears throat> the inference to intelligent design that I've made is not just based on common experience. We have lots of common experience outside of the laboratory of intelligent agents generating information. But I think it's interesting that origin of life research, origin of life simulation experiments themselves have demonstrated the need for intelligence to generate information, to constrain possibilities, to generate a teleological outcome, to, to, to generate a functional outcome. So I think original life research itself supports an inference to intelligent design, and that's where I'll stop my talk. Well, Steve, thank you very much for that. Uh, very persuasive case, I think. And I had just been eyeing the YouTube chat, and I know there's a fair 
number of comments, both comments and questions. So let me hand back to David and uh, he can moderate and help us through that. We may well be joined. Jim, do feel free to join in. Uh, we also have Jonathan McClatchy, who's been looking after the, uh, the back office, as it were. And we have Alistair Noble, Dr. Alistair Noble, who's one of the C4ID board members here in the UK. And I think it's likely he'll come in on the act as well. David, thank you. You're muted, David. I will also take myself off mute. Um, I'll kick one off with Steve, and um, I've saved one from earlier that um, I can ask Steve and Jim. But if I start with Steve, question came in. Um, what do you think about Alfred Russell Wallace and his research, the so-called intelligent evolution? Well, there's an echo of Wallace's idea now in um, contemporary uh, evolutionary theory. Uh, <clears throat> some of, I think some of you all attended, uh, as, as I did and a number of others, the uh, 2016 meeting four years ago of the Royal Society and uh, investigating new trends in evolutionary biology. One of the prime movers in that was uh, the, the, a very fine University of Chicago cell biologist, uh, Jim Shapiro. Shapiro's like many of the, the, uh, the people who are organizing the, the 2016 conference is pretty much done with neo-Darwinism. And, and, and one of his reasons for rejecting the neo-Darwinian mutation selection mechanism is that he doesn't think that mutations are actually random. He thinks that many mutations are under a kind of um, algorithmic control or they're subject to a, uh, a pre-programmed, th there is within cells a pre-programmed adaptive capacity. And so many of us in the ID world have actually actually think that Shapiro's work is super interesting and think that what he's identified is uh, our, our processes that are real, that are not captured by a neo-Darwinian kind of biology. And they point to a prior, uh, that pre-programmed adaptive capacity is um, what we would think of as the primary locus of design. It's the information that allows the cell to respond in an if-then sort of way to stimuli from outside, activating certain um, sort of um, you know, protein synthesis mechanisms or whatever that the, the cell is able to react to and adapt to environmental stressors because of pre-programmed adaptive capacity. So I think a, a, a complete view of biology acknowledges a certain amount of evolutionary adaptation as possible, but always on the basis of pre-existing information at where the pre-existing information is the locus of design. The, uh, the, that information requires intelligence to explain. Once it's built into a system, it allows a certain amount of adaptive capacity. So I think Wallace was in a sense saying that there is, there is designed evolution. The question, and I think it's a research question, is how wide are the envelopes of variability within a given, within given organisms? I tend to take a more polyphyletic view and think that the higher taxonomic categories are a discontinuous and, and, um, and uh, but there is adaptive capacity within the lower taxonomic categories, um, genus and species, and, and maybe up to the level of families, I think. Okay, thanks. This is the question I say from earlier. If I ask it to you first, Steve, and then same question to Jim. The question is, isn't intelligence itself a sufficient scientific mechanism to detect and know whether something was designed or not. Now, but come at me with that again. I'm, uh, yeah. Is or, or isn't intelligent itself, the existence, I suppose, of our intelligence, is that itself a sufficient scientific mechanism to detect and know whether something was designed or not? Well, let me tease that apart. Um, the we think of intelligence or the action of an intelligent agent as a cause. Now, I'm going to lift my arm up here and show you a pad of paper. I did that as a volitional act. I have direct introspective awareness of my causal powers as an agent. Every person on this uh, simulcast does. And uh, it's presupposed in every action that we make that such agency is a reality, that we possess it, and it's part of the world around us. Uh, the great philosopher of science, Thomas Nagel, wrote his book, Mind and Cosmos in 2012. 
And he rejected the neo-Darwinian account of evolutionary biology because it had no account for the origin of mind or for the reality of mind. And he said, that's part of the cosmos. That's part of the, our experience. If you can't account for that, you've got a problem. So we all know that we have minds. Then the next question is, well, how can we detect the activity of mind in, in effects, in the, in the echo of, of, of the action of another mind? And the, the method of design detection that our colleague William Dembski developed in his, his classic book, The Design Inference, says, uh, uh, argued that there were two features of systems when jointly present will reliably indicate uh, the activity of a mind. And this was the idea of a small, a very small probability, but then a specification, which he characterized either as a, a kind of functional uh, arrangement of things, a functional specification, or a pattern that could be matched. So without going into all of this, the idea, I think the, the idea is that mind is real. What I would say about the question is that mind is a real, is something we know. Intelligence is something that we know directly through our own introspective experience. And we have methods of detecting it. We do it all the time. When you see those inscriptions on the Rosetta Stone, you know that that was a product of mind, not wind and erosion. And our, our colleague Dembski has told us a bit more about how you detect it. And we make use of that in making the case for intelligent design. So that makes the detection of design a proper scientific enterprise. We have criteria for detecting it. Okay, so same question in a similar way to Jim, but does the existence of the mind, the brain, the intelligence or whatever, does that in itself convince you of a designer or uh, that you can detect whether something was designed? Um, you know, I, I've never thought about it in that way, David. Um, so, so I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a bifurcated individual. I, I, I love science and I use the tools of science. And I personally love and respect the scriptures, the Bible. And uh, uh, using the tools that chemists are bound to we don't have a way of assessing intelligent design. And that's why I have always said, I am not pushing intelligent design. I'm sympathetic to the arguments, but I have no way to measure it because we have no tools within the field of chemistry. And I hold my colleagues to the same standards that show me, show me the chemistry for this. Now, what, what, uh, what Steve has put forth is, is an interesting argument. And I think that, that there, there's a lot of credibility here. Um, and then there's the argument that you're putting forth to saying, isn't the mind itself sufficient? And neither of those is, is sufficient in itself to, to, to cause intelligence, to use this term intelligent design within the field of chemistry, because we say, what tool reveal that to you? What tool reveal that to you? Now, it may be that at some point, they're going to allow us to incorporate that tool into, into our explanation. And maybe I'm the one that can bring it in there. On the other side of it is, is uh, I believe what the scriptures say, that, 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 that God is the one who created all of this. Now, if you take it philosophically, you're speaking to the wrong man. You got to be speaking to Steve because I don't even think of things in that context. But he makes a very interesting argument that, uh, uh, and it, it's sort of like I'm saying, I, but I come at it a different way. And I say, I have never seen molecules move in a life-friendly direction. I've never seen them move into an order that would allow you to, to store information in, any more than a, B, A, B, some constant sequence that, that, that's occurring. Other than that, they don't assemble into that order unless somebody is actually pushing them, using some tools of chemistry to force them into that order, or there's some other biological entity acting upon them. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but for me, if I'm going to, if I'm going to argue against these people for what they're doing, I'm using the tools of chemistry to do that. But that's not to say that I'm discounting these other arguments. I think that, that there's a lot of val validity in them. It's just that they don't function in the realm in which I'm attacking. Well, I can, I can tell you, Jim, you had a big thank you 
on YouTube from the person who asked the question. So I think you have okay. answered the question. Can I move David, it on? David, on could, I, could I jump back in on this? Because this, I think this is very interesting. And it's one of the uh, reasons that I think it was just such a good uh, idea to have Jim and me both on this together because Jim is, is working in the realm of bench chemistry. He's looking at, and, and properly so, he's looking at how molecules currently work and, and what chemical reactions occur and don't occur. So he's looking at how nature ordinarily operates. The argument I'm making is within a different realm. Some would call it philosophy, but it's actually, uh, the, the argument I'm making is, is within the framework of historical sciences that have a different kind of uh, method that is based on what's going on in the bench sciences, the experimental sciences, but it's attempting to reconstruct the past using this logic of inference to the best explanation or the method of multiple competing hypotheses. And it's the very method that Darwin used in The Origin of Species. I studied it self-consciously as part of my, my uh, uh, dissertation work. And, and so in a sense, the, 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 what Jim is doing and what I'm doing are complementary, but they're not the same thing. He's, he's at the bench seeing what do the molecules do and then I'm saying, well, look at what he's noticed. What, look at what these other origin of life researchers have, have, have demonstrated, that you can't get the, the molecules to move in a life-friendly direction unless you have the intelligent intervention of the experimenters. And I think that's telling us something. That's part of what's being simulated because what's happened is a lot of these origin of life guys are just, they, they become unaware. They forget that their hands and their minds are shaping the outcomes. And so the, yet they turn around and claim that the molecules are doing this on their own. And clearly that's a non sequitur. And if so, the, if those experiments are simulating anything, they're, they're simulating intelligent design. But that's a conclusion of the historical, using the historical scientific method. And it, it's, it's uh, entirely appropriate for Jim to say, hey, I'm at the bench. I'm just looking at what the, the chemistry does. And I'm, I'm, I'm then taking what he and others have learned at the bench and saying, okay, now let's reason about it in the way that Darwin and Lyell and others taught us to do if we're trying to reconstruct the past. And here's the best explanation given what we know now. Okay. Uh, I, could, could I come in for a moment? Um, uh, thank you both for two excellent talks. Uh, Steve, um, you may not be aware of this, but to listening to you tonight, I felt I was reliving a moment from 2005 when I heard you for the first time talk about this at a seminar in Cambridge. Now, I've taught chemistry, I've taught pupils about DNA, I've taught them about the beauty of its structure and how it was discovered. But in that, in that uh, seminar, I had a eureka moment when I saw the information content of DNA. It had never occurred to me before. And when I saw it, it was quite an overwhelming experience of discovery on my part. What I want to ask you, Steve, is, it seems to me that the existence of information in DNA is a killer argument for design. And what is your experience of the level of acceptance of this in academia? I mean, it was so obvious to me, I do not understand why people can resist this. Well, yeah, there's a, and of course, there's a wonderful story about the discovery of the structure and Watson. And, and Crick looking at the, their model when they had it all finally assembled and got the pieces together. And Crick says, it's so beautiful, it has to be right. You know, the, <laughs> the aesthetic judgment is so important a lot of times in science. But, um, well, the, 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 I, I found that th this argument is moving a lot of people, opening a lot of minds. And we've had a, a, a number of very high profile scientists in the last five or six years who have in a sense, um, joined ranks with the intelligent design research program and now are taking the idea of intelligent design and using it to generate other testable hypotheses, looking for other features of the genome, design patterns in the genome that we might expect to be there if, if the, the, um, the, uh, the cell were designed. So I've also very oftentimes had the reaction after giving either this talk or a longer version of this or, or uh, after people have read Signature in the Cell, this, the, the same kind of our response you have, what, what's the problem? Why would anyone object to this? This seems extremely persuasive. What's the best answer to this? And the, what do your opponents most commonly say? Or your, and the, the argument I most commonly get is, well, that, but that's not science, okay? And this gets back to that whole definitional issue. And 
what and, and I think there's a couple things to say to that. The first is uh, we're not principally concerned to know how to classify the argument for intelligent design. Uh, we want to know whether the argument is true or most likely to be true. Uh, and so uh, saying, well, that's not science, it's philosophy, or that's not science, it's religion, or that's not science, it's something else, doesn't really refute the argument. It just re recategorizes the kind of argument it is. And what I've shown in my work is that actually the case for intelligent design is a kind of science, a well-established kind of science, known as the, it's an historical scientific argument. It's trying to explain an event in the remote past based on our knowledge of cause and effect pr um, uh, processes in the present and our knowledge of the effect to be explained. And what we know about information is that it does indeed always arise from a, a, a mind, not an, un, an, uh, an undirected material process, especially if the information is functional and in a digital form. So I don't know, of, I, 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 let me put it this way. I don't think there are strong um, counter arguments to the argument that I've formulated that are positing alternative explanations that provide a better explanation for the origin of information. What people do instead is make a meta argument about the legitimacy of talking about intelligent design and saying it's out of bounds, we can't talk about it because it's not science, but then they invariably have to invoke a definition of science that's very self-serving and question begging. For example, some will say, well, it's not scientific because uh, the, you can't observe an intelligent designer in the laboratory uh, and unobservable entities aren't part of science, but try applying that standard to uh, evolutionary biology where you're positing unobservable events in the remote past to explain if, uh, evidence that we see in the present, or try applying it to theoretical physics, where we have all kinds of unobservable forces and fields and entities that we posit on the basis of their ability to explain. It's quite common in science to posit an unobservable entity uh, on the basis of its explanatory power, and to hold that if, in fact, it provides the best explanation. So, um, so I think the, the main objections to intelligent design have been at that sort of meta philosophical level, alternative explanations for the origin of information necessary to produce the first life have not been forthcoming. RNA world has failed for the reasons I explained. And I think, I think ID stands as the best explanation. And I think a lot of, a lot of a very good scientists are saying so, or, or saying so at least to us privately as, as, wow. the, as the iceberg you know, kind of starts to melt. No, no, Steve, I'm going to need to Steve, sorry, I just need to pick up on that co comment, Steve, because that's where I wanted to move on to, which is what other scientists are saying to you privately and publicly. Uh, one of the questions, which is to both of you, is um, have you had discussions with some of the more well-known, one of the questions sites, people like David Attenborough or some of the more well-known proponents, whether it's on a popular level or scientific level, and what's their response to you privately as opposed to publicly? I, th I think Jim wanted to get in first, and then I'll, I'll come back to your question, in, in particular about Attenborough, because I had a chance to debate him on your BBC radio, so. Okay, so, <laughs> so Jim. I, I, I've, I've noticed that if I'm alone with them in my office, they, they in many ways agree with me. I'll ask them, I said, do, do you understand how this came about? Do you understand? And they, they, they will say, no, no, we don't understand. I, I was talking with a biophysicist at the Weissman Institute, who's not, not a Christian. I mean, as far as I know, he's, he's, he's a Jew. And, and, uh, and, I, and I said to him, uh, uh, he was explaining to me about the, the stiffness of, the, of the, this rod in our ear and how the modulus, the stiffness of the rod changes as you go along it. And it's because of that, that we get this amazing region of, of sound that we can hear. And I said, how, could you tell me how does something like that, where you have the modulus changing throughout it, uh, a rod like that, which is hard to do in a material sense. So how, how, do you, how do you think that evolved? And he said, oh, Jim, we all believe in evolution, but we have no idea how it happened. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then what I've noticed though, is if I have two of them in my office and I'll confront them with the same question, Neither of them will answer me. They'll just stare at me. So, so uh, uh, when they're alone, they have the same reservations that I have about this. When there's two of them, they will not comment openly. 
when they're in groups, they all, it's, 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 it's the masses just carry them all forward. That's been my experience. Okay. Steve? Yeah, uh, our colleague at Discovery Institute, David Klinghoffer, uh, says that the main impetus in the conti in, for continued support of evolutionary theory is social anxiety. And the, 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 you don't need to be uh, a genius rocket scientist to, to see the, the, the problems with the theory. They're, they've been well understood for a very long time, both by the problems, both biological and chemical evolutionary theory. Um, and that's and that's why in the in the technical literature you have so much ferment and so many new evolutionary mechanisms or theories being proposed because the standard textbook theories are not are not adequate and people understand this um, and so we we've had a number of people approach us privately who have later become public proponents of intelligent design one example of that is the very prominent German paleontologist Gunter Beckley who in 2009 was um, curating the bicentennial Darwin exhibit at the Stuttgart Museum of Natural History, the largest natural history museum in Europe. Um, Beckley's, uh, Beckley was the, the lead curator for this Darwin exhibition. He had a wonderful kind of illustration of, uh, of a scales of justice with the origin of species on one side and a whole bunch of books on intelligent design on the other. And against the laws of physics, he had the one book uh, outweighing all the others. And he, he had a caption, the one book that outweighs them all, The Origin of Species. One of his colleagues said, Gunter, if you're gonna be representing us uh, with this, uh, this uh, exhibit, uh, you might have to talk to the media and they may ask you about this, those books on intelligent design, you better read some of them. And uh, Beckley later told me that was my mistake. <laughs> and so in uh, 16, he, he became a public proponent of intelligent design and, and um, and so there have been a lot of cases like that. There's a lot of people who are still very quiet in their, in their support. I've had the opportunity to debate both Peter Atkins and uh, David Attenborough on, uh, on British radio. And one of the things I found in debating some of these prominent public spokesmen for, uh, spokesmen for science or for scientific atheism, new atheist sort of folks, is that they tend to come into these debates thinking that I'm gonna be defending a very simplistic version of young earth creationism or something. And then they're surprised at the arguments and not prepared to respond to the actual arguments that we're making. And, and so um, I, I think that's also indicative of the shift. There's been this idea that the only way you might uh, oppose standard evolutionary theory is if you were uh, held to a particular reading of Genesis and that the arguments against evolutionary theory are gonna be primarily biblical. And they're surprised to find people that know the molecular biology and know uh, and, and have a different way of formulating the argument as we've done for intelligent design. So I think that's one of the reasons a lot of minds are, are, are opening. Thanks, Steve. I think Jonathan McClatchy wanted to come in with a question. Sure, I have a question for Jim Tours. Uh, you said during your presentation, quite rightly, that you distance yourself from the God of the gaps argument. Would you? Uh, acknowledge the Steve's argument that he presented today is not a God of the gaps argument. No, no, I don't think it's a God of the gaps argument. God of the gaps argument is quite dismissive. And uh, um, so, so I, I, I think, I think that uh, uh, what Steve and some of his other colleagues are trying to get at is to, is to put, put some parameters about this so that we can assign this definition uh, because it certainly makes sense, this definition, and, uh, and, and, and in a way quantify something that's there. I mean, I've, I've looked at God of the gaps as being dismissive. And, and so if you took a, if, if, if you took a, a person in the 1850s and you said, you know, what's, you know, how, how, do, how does a cell operate? How come, how does, how does a child look by, like their parent? We have no idea, only God could know. Well, now we know why a child looks like their parent because this is encoded in the DNA. And, and uh, um, so, so we learn things over time. That's why, that's why I, I can never just, just dismiss this thing and just saying, oh, you know, we, we can't know that, that's up to God is that we learn things and, 
I don't know where we're going to be in a few hundred years, but I can tell you we are nowhere close to understanding the origin of life scientifically. And I'll maintain we might someday understand the origin of life. And then, you know, I think the believers will just praise God and say, wow, that, that, that is amazing. That's utterly amazing. And when I, when I learn something new in the biological realm, I'm very often just find myself giving thanks to God for, for, the, for, for how amazing that is. And, and uh, um, you know, how beautiful that is. And, and, and how that happened. Jim, can I, can I follow up on that? Because one of the questions I think fits in with that, which is, do we know enough about the chemistry uh, and the, the area of the origin of life? Do we know enough actually positively to rule out uh, anything other than intelligent design? So the question... No, I, I, the, I don't think so. I think that... that uh, I don't think we can rule it out based on the chemistry. So, for example, the question said, are, are, the, other, are the others, the other solutions to origin of life, demonstrably impossible? Laws of physics, bond energy, second law, all conspire against polymer production. So, so do those facts mean that we can rule out anything other than intelligent design, or can we not go that far? Well, I, I, can, rule it, I can rule out a lot of the proposals just based... On, on, on knowing how molecules come together. And that reduces also to thermodynamics. Uh, when, when, you, when, you have, when you have the enthalpy is negative on a certain step, and so that it, it takes a lot of energy to go back, you've now set yourself down a direction that's very hard to go back. And then you have another enthalpically negative step. It's very, very hard to go back. And then photochemical reactions, it's hard very often to take to go back on a photochemical reaction, and so so photochemical reactions are don't don't so it's, it's it's often very hard to go back. So I think that there are thermodynamic arguments that suggest that many of the things that are put forward in Origin of Life are just a bunch of nonsense. And then on and, arrival, yeah, yeah. Steve's Steve's colleague Brian Miller, who I'll, I'll be interviewing on my YouTube channel uh, very soon, is is put forth many thermodynamics arguments about the energy that's needed to keep a system in a non-equilibrium state like that. What is the energy involved in keeping it in that non-equilibrium state, which is a highly complex non-equilibrium state? And he's crunched some of these numbers and it's, it, it, it's just very hard to think about it. And because that's what I do. I don't just build a molecule. We build nanosystems. We build where we try to have molecules come together and, and do some action as a system. And it's really hard to think about doing that. And then you look at a cell and you just, you just throw up your hand. You say, I have no idea how it's pulling this thing off. Again, that doesn't mean that we'll never know. I, can, I can't say that. Um, but but uh, uh, anyway, Steve, what do you think? Yeah, let, uh, and let me uh, answer this also by reference to Jonathan's earlier question about God of the gaps. Um, a God of the gaps argument is um, another way of referring to the logical fallacy of an argument from ignorance. And arguments from ignorance have the following form. I say that cause A is not sufficient to produce uh, outcome X. Therefore, I say, cause B must have done it. But the problem with that way of reasoning is that there might have been a cause C, D, or E, or F that could have produced cause X, or e, outcome X, and I haven't ruled those out. I haven't evaluated them. And so, uh, nor have I provided a positive reason for thinking that my alternative cause is better than the cause that I've ruled out. So, um, and when we we're accused, we've been accused of making these arguments from ignorance and God of the gaps arguments by uh, by, by some of the new atheist folks. Uh, Michael Shermer has said, said uh, in fact, every time I debate him, he he claims that intelligent design is an argument of ignor from ignorance in the same in the same form. You're saying, well, just because life has all this specified complexity and these natural processes couldn't do it, therefore it must have been an intelligent designer. But that's not how we're reasoning. We, there's, a, there's another premise in the argument that's, that is not being represented by our critics. We're arguing 
that despite a thorough search for naturalistic causes capable of producing specified information, um, that, um, <clears throat> that, that as a result of a thorough search, we can rule out a number of natural causes that are unable to produce specified information. And yet we know of a cause that does produce information and that cause is intelligence. We have positive knowledge of the causal powers of minds or intelligent agents in producing digital code, for example. And so the, there is a positive premise in the argument that distinguishes it from an argument from ignorance or a God of the gaps argument. We're saying there is a positive reason to, to think that, th that there is positive evidence of the causal power of mind with respect to this specific effect that we're seeing. We're seeing code. We know that it takes a programmer. Um, now, um, the other thing to say is, so that makes this kind of argument an inference to the best explanation, not an argument from ignorance. And that's a valid scientific form of argument, albeit one which is always, because it's based on scientific evidence, it's always provisional. Every scientific inference is provisional. So this is, this is what's characteristic of scientific reasoning. You, you make an inference based on all the knowledge you have now. You may get future knowledge that causes you, causes you to revise your, your inference or your theory or your explanation, but that's just the way science progresses. And so we're making that kind of a provisional argument for intelligent design is the best explanation based on the positive knowledge we have, the positive evidence we have for the unique causal powers or adequacy of intelligence with respect to the generation of information. Now there's, there's there, that's, that's, um, that's the form of the argument. Now, I think the argument can be strengthened further by looking at what we do know about the chemistry and the thermodynamics and some of those things that Jim was saying. I think there's a whole lot of approaches that can be simply ruled out. I don't, is it possible for me to share my screen just briefly one more time? Is that? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Let me just um, look at, sh show you one slide that I, I, I didn't really get to go into. So if we go, yeah. So one of the main approaches to origin of life research has been this self-organizational approach. And the, the idea of that was that the, the, the bonding affinities of the subunits of the biomacromolecules that carry information are causing the sequential arrangements that produce the information. That was a long sentence, so let me break it down a little bit more. The idea here, let's look at DNA. The idea of the self-organizational ideas, and th this is one of the three main approaches to explaining the origin of life, was that the constituent uh, monomers, the nucleotide bases, the, the sugars and the phosphates, have intrinsic chemical binding affinities for one another that would cause an arrangement, an information rich arrangement of bases to arise. We now know that that is completely untrue. It's not, it's not chemically plausible. If you look at the model of the, the structural formula of the DNA mo molecule on the screen, you see that there are bonds represented by little sticks between the, the P's for the phosphates and the pentagons for the sugars. There's, there are bonds between the bases and the sugar phosphate backbone but there are no bonds at all along the message bearing spine of the molecule between the A's, C's, G's, and T's. There's no stereochemical effects that could produce the sequencing. There's no, there's not just, it's not just that there are no bonding, differential bonding affinities, there are no bonds at all. And then as to the connection between the bases and the backbone, it's the same, it's the same end glycosidic bond in every case so that there's no chemical reason why the A's or the T's or the G's have to attach to any given site. There's complete chemical freedom. So one thing we know from the chemistry of DNA is that the message bearing axis, the, the sequential arrangement of the basis on the message bearing axis of the DNA is not the product of underlying self-organizational chemical properties. That, now for 20 years, self-organization was the key approach in origin of life studies. This can now be completely categorically eliminated from consideration. And I think pure chance has been eliminated for equally strong reasons. And now, you know, I, I, I showed that the, the, the chance plus um, um, natural selection approach also has deep, not only chemical problems, but deep theoretical problems. So I, I think what you're, if you're honestly looking at this field of origin of life research and you look at the three categories of explanation, they each have profound problems that are not likely to go away. And so I think it's a very, it's a very, um, 
well, the inference to design is, it is provisional, but I don't think it's likely that we're gonna get a solution to the problem of origin, the origin of information from within the framework of materialistic chemistry. I don't think it's gonna happen. And we've got a, got a lot of good reasons for thinking of that. If we might turn out to be wrong, that's the way science goes, but um, chemistry and physics are, we, we don't get information out of pure chemistry and physics. There's nothing in our wealth of human experience that shows that. And to continue barking up that tree, I think is gonna keep original life research in a state of permanent impasse. Okay, thank you very much, both of you. I need to draw it to a close. And I just wanna finish with a couple of questions to both of you. You might have to stop your screen share, Steve. You bet. Um, it's a, there's a specific question to Jim, which leads to the wider question. The, the wider question is to what extent, if any, have you, that's Steve and Jim, uh, suffered um, professionally as a result of um, coming public with these views. And the specific question to Jim, which led to that, is that is asked that it's understood that the editorial board of Wikipedia removed him from their list of accepted authorities after he accepted intelligent design. And the question is, can he confirm if that's true? But that that's the specific question. But generally, I suppose to Jim first, have, do you think you've suffered professionally as a result of challenging? what might be said to be the orthodox views? Okay, so I, I, I've had on my website for 10 years that I don't, I don't endorse intelligent design. I'm not against it, I'm sympathetic, but I have no tool to measure it. So, you know, it, it doesn't matter. I'm thrown in with that lot anyway. So it, it doesn't matter, I guess, even though I've, I've, I've clearly said that, that I don't have a way to measure it. So that's, I never use intelligent design as an argument in any of my talks. As far as what Wikipedia has done, you're the first to tell me that. So if I'm not deemed an authority by Wikipedia, oh, big whoop. I mean, I'm, 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 just, I'm heartbroken. I'm just heartbroken. I've never, I never knew that, but now that I know, I'm heartbroken. Now, so it doesn't matter to me at all. I don't know who the Wikipedia authority is that, that, that uh, is able to make such an assessment. Uh, uh, but as far as suffering professionally, uh, yeah, I've suffered professionally. I mean, there, there are two, two individuals at, at federal agencies within the U.S. government have told me that I was not funded because of positions that I have taken on that issue that had nothing to do, the research had nothing to do with that. Uh, but on the other side of it, you know, I told you I'm a bifurcated individual. On the other side of it, I have this implicit trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it's just amazing. I just trust him. And as a result of that, in spite of it being so hard for me to get federal funding, I'm, one of, I'm either the top one or two best funded researchers in this university uh, because, you know, I, I get from other sources that are non-traditional sources. Now I do have a Department of Energy grant. I do have a, uh, an Air Force grant, an Air Force grant that I've had for many, many years, uh, but I've lost, a, and I do have an NIH grant, but I, I've lost many grants from, from what I've been told. You, you never know, you never know why you lose a grant. I am not part of certain academies and because I've told you will never get in because of the position that you have taken on that. Uh, but it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost become comical that Jim Tour is not a member of those academies, yet people who have done less than half as much of him as him have gotten in those academies. And then they start to inquire, why isn't he part of the academy? And then people are shocked why I'm not part of the academy, because I took a certain position on something. That, that, that is poking the bear or something like that. And, and uh, uh, so, yes, I have suffered professionally in one way, but on the other side of it, my research is just exploding. I mean, it just, the discoveries that we're making and the things that we're doing, I'm having a grand time. So I am being rewarded multiple times over by my Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I believe because uh, uh, the things that we're discovering are just, just uh, uh, too exciting for me to, to even think that I could ever have thought of those all by myself. But anyway, so that, that's kind of my answer. But let me put it in biblical terms. 
in biblical terms, it talks about suffering. And it says, you have not, in the Hebrews, you have not yet shed blood in your cause. And so I've never shed any blood. So whatever I've gone through is, is, is just, just a five-year-old type suffering. It's, it's nothing to really, to really knock somebody out with. Thanks, Jim. Steve, same question to you. Yeah, my experience has been similar. There have been people that have opposed, and uh, I, um, <clears throat> and I, I have, you know, have the the I have a Wikipedia stigma that uh, I'm a, a, a proponent of pseudo the pseudo scientific theory of intelligent design. One of our colleagues, uh, Gunter Beckley, was eliminated, erased from Wikipedia. He was a great evidence, and or he was a great expert in insect paleontology until he endorsed intelligent design, and then after that, he became a non person. But the, these are uh, there, there are scientists in our network who have who have had ex, uh, very severe uh, experience of um, the abridgment of their academic freedom. Uh, I've not experienced much of that. I'm I'm uh, now at Discovery Institute. I was at a university for 12 years, but now I'm at Discovery full time. And of course, we're promoting this idea, and so we're more aware of others who have suffered than we are ourselves suffering from many academic opposition. Although there's plenty plenty of opposition, but not not persecution in that sense. Um, and then, and, but on the flip side, this is just an, it's been an exciting ride. I mean, the, the network of scientists worldwide that we're connected with and to the conferences, the, the breakthroughs and research. I just want to just give a bit of a spotlight on, on, on Jim. He has 600 peer reviewed publications, 150 patents. He's making breakthroughs in graphene research. He has a cancer project that is absolutely extraordinary. What he's doing with, uh, the redesign of nanomachines to uh, to um, uh, develop a new therapeutic approach to cancer. Th this this man is an incredibly creative scientist, and if uh, if some funding sources have deprived him of support because he's been skeptical about various branches of evolutionary theory, I would say it's their loss because uh, he's he's just not allowed it to cause him to break stride in the least. So he's he's a dynamo, and we're we're. Uh, you know, really, really always excited to, to see the, the great developments that are coming out of his lab. Okay, thanks, Steve. Can I wrap it up with a final question? And it, it's related to that. Jim, it might be said that you're now at a seniority and level of career that you, uh, it's a lot easier for you to take a stand. What would your advice be to younger, uh, whether it's students, postgraduate students, chemists, the sort that come into your room and when they're on their own, are prepared to agree with you, but can't agree with you if even one other person is in the room. What's your advice to them, given that they presumably fear that they would suffer uh, more than you have because they haven't got your seniority? So I, I, I think that's real. When, when I started, uh, there was not this attack based on this argument. There was, and, and uh, um, I, I didn't even really... This was a non-issue to me as well. And then in, in, uh, it all happened. It happened because of Discovery Institute, I think. The problems in life happened because of Discovery Institute. Is that, is that, uh, that there was a statement that was sent around in around 2000, 2001 on, on uh, um, this dissent that has been now called the dissent from Darwinism statement. It came to me in a quick email. And it said, uh, uh, could you agree with this? I said, yeah, I could agree with that. It, it, I'm telling you, it was like two seconds. I agreed. It. I had no idea that this would become like, like the touchstone of the argument. And this whole problem started, I think, with the, with the Dover trial and, and uh, some of this. And then it started to take, to take root, at least in my world, from what I saw. Maybe that's not a... That, that, and... and um, but all of a sudden I had had my hat thrown in with them. But then when I looked back at the statement, I could not disagree with it. That, that it just says that, that we're not content, we're, we're not satisfied with, with uh, uh, random mutation and natural selection to account for the diversity of life. Therefore, further research is warranted. I mean, that's it. It doesn't say that it's wrong. It doesn't just say further research is warranted. What? What scientist on earth is going to say we've done enough? No, I mean, if we've done enough, then why is there an origin of life research program? If we've done enough, why are people studying evolution if we know it? Of course, more research is warranted. And so, so um, uh, I couldn't disagree with it. 
And then it was, you know, I attended a meeting. Steve was there. In fact, Steve was one of the ones who invited me. And I was asked to, to, to write more on this topic. And I started to really investigate it and I learned more. And I thought, man, I'm on, the, I'm on the side of right on this thing. I'm on the right side of this. And what really got me is that there were two members more senior than me. One was a Nobel Prize winner and none, another was on the National Academy. And I met with them and I, and I was talking with them. And they said, you know, that, that there are things they're not going to put me forward to because of my position on that. I said, guys. I've remained pretty quiet about this, but if this is what you're going to do, I'm coming out of the closet and I'm going to go for this. And that's when I started writing about this and really taking a stand. So they pushed me into this. I mean, you just take a guy minding his own business and you start coming at him. He's going to react back. And I have. So that's, that's kind of what happened to me. Dave. Well, and plus good old David Berlinski started publishing his articles in the journal Inference, and that's, that's uh, created a worldwide interest in, in Tour's critique. Before Jim Tour, there was another Origin of Life scientist named Robert Shapiro, and uh, <clears throat> he was an honest chemist, and he, he was uh, you know an Origin of Life researcher, but he was always the guy to say, wait a minute, doesn't work that way, time out. The chemistry doesn't do what you're saying. And he passed away a few years ago. I had a chance to meet him uh, at, at the, the, uh, one of the conferences that Jim mentioned. And he was a terrific scientist, but with his passing, there needed to be somebody to step up and hold these origin of life researchers accountable. And Professor Tour, I think, is now filling those shoes admirably. And, and let me just mention, because I forgot to say for the young researchers out there, I've written about this on my website. So if you go to jmtour.com and you look under the evolution creation statement, you'll see where I, I, I write about this. It is, it is true. If you take a stand on this, you, it, you're, you're in for a, a rough time. And again, I can't counsel you on what you should do. If, if you were to wait until you got a position in the US, and we call it tenure, I'm not sure what, what you call it over there, uh, where it's, it's hard it's hard to get fired for your views at w once you have tenure. Um, it's not impossible, but it's hard. But they can also make your life miserable as they have tried to for me. But I'll tell you, I started this, you know, th this, this started, I was already a chaired professor. I mean, I, I mean, which in the U.S. means that somebody helps to even supplement your salary. So, yeah, I was a chaired professor when I started taking a stand on this. I was a brand new assistant professor when I started taking a stand about my faith in Jesus Christ. I put a scripture verse at the top of every exam since, since the beginning, since my first exam. And so, you know, and, and I had a lot of interaction and, and, I, and I noticed students would write scripture verses back to me. The most common one on the exam that they would write back is, blessed are the merciful. <laughs> and, 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 and so so i did take a stand on certain things it, but i understand some of your hesitations i do and and uh um but at some point you're you're going to have to start coming out and taking a stand maybe you want to wait a few years on that again i'm not i i can't i can't uh um, I, I would understand what, why you might want to wait a few years other people say they like the fire and they're just going at it and Richard Bugs was one of them. And uh, I think he's been rewarded on the other side and he's done very well there at, at Kew Gardens and, and uh, uh, I, I think it's University College London. Yeah. Thanks ever so much, uh, Jim. It generally left for me to say thank you to both of you before I hand back to David Galloway, but it's been a fantastic evening. Thank you ever so much for taking the time to do it. I know that there's been great comments online and people have enjoyed the talk. So I pass on their thanks to you as well. So thank you, Steve, and thank you, Jim. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you, David, Alistair, David, and everyone for having us. Thank well, you so much. Yeah, great. Well, let me just let me just wind up. I've got a couple of announcements for people who are watching Jonathan. this thing. So uh, just before you all disappear, let me just add my thanks to our speakers today for providing an update and a challenge and some persuasive pointers to the mystery of life's origin. And indeed, Steve, for offering some treatment to the for the social anxiety that sometimes characterizes the scientific world. Jim, let me just say personally, a thank you to you for, first of all, for demonstrating just how high the bar is that needs to be cleared 
in order to produce even relatively simple molecules, at least relatively simple in terms of the molecules required for living systems, and also for deconstructing the hype behind some of the things that are trotted out to the public as settled or uncontroversial conclusions. And Steve, thank you for providing such a thoughtful analysis, building a case for a credible and rational cause, one that we recognise in every aspect of daily life. And most of us using the tools of rationalisation and logical assessment are persuaded that the evidence does indeed point persuasively to the role of a designing agency. So folks, I would just encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the little bell to receive notifications of future events. And if you'd like to receive regular emails from us, do register on the website, C4ID, uh, and uh, you can hit the contact us option there and add your email address and we'll keep you updated. Let me just say you've heard a little bit tonight about Gunter Bechley. Gunter is going to be uh, speaking in a, in a webinar coming up in January and he's promised to take a closer look at the fossil record. So keep in touch with us and we'll keep you posted with that and with some of our other plans. We may well have another one, another webinar in November. So once again, thank you to both of our speakers this evening for a most stimulating event. I hope we can welcome you back on some future occasion. It would be wonderful to do it on an in-person basis at a conference, but this has been an excellent platform and we're very grateful to you for investing the time in producing such an interesting session today. So till the next time, do stay away from the pesky virus. Thank you very much. And thank you. From thank you.